Hello? No, not him. Test one, two. Okay, that's weird. Okay. Yeah, it, get, it gets confused. I know they're not working. Test one, two. All right, good. Okay. Um, just before we get started, let me take care of a little technical procedural business. Uh, when you come up to speak, just press the speaker button one time. Don't, don't press it twice. If you do, it'll cut off the speaker system temporarily. So uh, I realize uh, we've all been challenged with technology these last several months and it still seems to be an issue, so. Okay. All right, so uh, my name is Dodd Galbraith. I'm the chairman of the Metro Stormwater Board Committee. I'd like to open our meeting for official business. This is uh, our September 2nd, 2021 meeting. Our first order of business is to review the meeting minutes and decision letters from our last meeting of August 5th. So all of our committee members should have uh, the minutes and the decision letters uh, on their electronic device. So if you all would please uh, review those for just a minute or two since we are in a live deliberation session and see if you see any edits or corrections you want to make. And uh, we'd like to encourage you to uh, offer a motion to approve the meeting minutes and decision letters in, in one motion if you don't mind. I'll, I'll motion on the floor. I make a motion to approve both the, all the decision letters and the meeting um, minute meetings from July first, twenty twenty one. All right. We have a motion from Ms. Adams that we uh, approve the minutes and decision letters from the August fifth committee meeting. All right. That's okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. We have a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those vote in favor by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Okay, if our first applicant, uh, Lake Providence, will come forward and just be seated. And um, 
If you'll be patient with us while we go through our administrative introductory process, uh, we'll call on you to speak in just a minute. You'll have 10 minutes to speak, uh, to present your case, uh, your proposal, and uh, then we'll open up the public hearing for public comment, and then we'll close it and have deliberation. So, staff, if you all would like to, uh, Mr. Logan, I'd like to proceed with the opening legal statement, then we'll introduce the case. The opening statement to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiori with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You're advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Would you like to introduce the case and introduce your name, please? Uh, my name is Elizabeth Steinstraw. I am a Metro Water um, Environmental Compliance Officer, and we originally um, inspected this case back in August of 2020, and um, subsequently an NON was issued on the 14th of August to the um, Lake Providence Missionary Baptist Church. Thank you. Is that it? And today we're here to see their final revised plan. Okay, excellent. Okay. All right. So at this time, we'd like to invite the applicants to speak. And uh, I'll start the 10 minute clock. And uh, thank you, sir, for coming back. Thank you. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, uh, we're here to try to get a resolution as to the restoring of the buffer zone that was um, uh, damaged with the storm and then after the storm, it was, I guess, damaged even more because we were uh, under the opinion that we could remove the trees that were there that were damaged by the storm as well as some of the underbrush and everything that was going on down there. Since then, we have not come to a total agreement with stormwater management as to where or how to restore that buffer. Uh, we have tried to uh, be in compliance with them and try to really work with them, but it seems like everything that we present, it is not acceptable to stormwater management. Now, I wish that some of you guys would go by there to our site to see it now, because even now we have not disturbed anything after we cut down those trees and it looks real bad. Uh, wild weeds and then some of the tree stumps, we did not disturb those tree stumps whatsoever. Some of those trees are growing back. We're just trying to do something that would be aesthetically pleasing as far as the community is concerned, be able to kind of keep up our property and make it look good to the rest of the community. We did not want to come in and uh, our property look bad whatsoever. So we have spent monies to try and come into compliance. Uh, we have not started to plant yet because we cannot come to a full agreement on what stormwater management is required. Thank you, sir. Uh, you, is there any other information? Thanks, sir. Turn. Please introduce yourself, please. There you go. Georgie. Okay, I'm James Johnson. I'm uh, legal counsel for Lake Providence uh, Missionary Baptist Church. Let me just give you a quick procedural background uh, with our 10 minutes. The last time we were here, I believe, was in May. Uh, uh, Metro Water presented its plan and uh, what they were asking us to present in terms of uh, restoring the buffer. Uh, we presented a plan uh, also, uh, and, be, and as Pastor said, we were not able to come to a an agreement on the plan. Uh, during that time, we discovered that uh, Metro did revise its plan and uh, lowered their caliper number inches. They were asking us to put in so many trees that equaled a certain caliper number of inches. Uh, initially, they were asking for 357 inches, and I think we were at 100 and 140, 170 something. Uh, during that meeting, we discovered that Metro or, or uh, lowered their number of caliper inches down to two, 268. 
we then went back and asked our landscape architect to increase our caliper inches so that we could come closer to what Metro wanted. Uh, they have it, uh, our landscape architect has increased our caliper inches. Uh, and so now our plans are, are I think at 230 caliper inches uh, for what we're planning, uh, offering to install and Metro is at 268. So therein lies the difference, just 30, caliper inch difference. And what I have here is I, I have copies of our revised plans that I would like to give to everyone so that we can look at and then we'll make our recommendation here. is highlighted uh, what you can see here uh, it is on the screen but if you look down at the highlighted portion here that I've highlighted this was prepared by our landscape art architect afterwards and what we are proposing is to put in shade trees these these will all be native trees as Metro has recommended that we do these are uh, shade trees 300 I'm sorry 23 shade trees uh, we will put in 46 accent trees and 23 evergreen trees. And these are in different diameters, three inch diameters, two and a half inch diameters, uh, and two inch diameters. For a total caliper inch diameter of 230, I think our landscape arch architect has 235 on here, but it actually adds up to 230. Metro is at 268. So there's, as I said, there's a difference of 38 inches there. So we have attempted to compromise with Metro uh, which is what we decided to do the, at the last meeting, was to go away and see if we could work out an agreement here. Now that we have done that, uh, our landscape architect, this plan complies with the requirements of the Metro Stormwater Manual, which says that if a landowner, such as Lake Providence, disturbs a buffer, that it has a duty to go back and attempt to restore that buffer. And there are several things that you must do uh, in terms of restoring the buffer. Number one, you have, to, you have to have a plan. That plan has to be provided and prepared by a landscape architect. We've complied. This was done by a landscape architect. That buffer zone, uh, the plan must uh, attempt to restore the buffer zone. Based on his uh, drawing, it does attempt to restore the buffer zone. Uh, uh, the, the requirements say that it must uh, mitigate the erosion and prevent the erosion of the soil. His plan addresses that as well with the, with the notes in here that we gave to you. The uh, manual also says that uh, the plan must uh, re, uh, contain a stabilization plan for, to stabilize the creek, the bank. Uh, the plan addresses that. It says it must also include the planting of native trees. We've agreed that we are going to plant native trees in there. As, as a matter of fact, Metro gave us a list of native trees that we are to consider. And I think that list cons consists of over 240 trees and Pastor Maxwell and the church has agreed that the trees that they put back in there will be native trees. Uh, the plan requires the planting of grasses that will not be mowed. This plan addresses that and we will install grasses near the creek that will not be mowed, that will also help stabilize the creek and to prevent the uh, erosion. The manual also says that we have to provide a two-year survivability uh, guarantee on that, but our plan provides 100% guarantee of survivability. So it's going to last for more than two years. The church agrees that if any of those trees dies during that time period, that they will go out and replant those trees to make sure that they survive. And it also says we have to have the appropriate schedule for implementation because we are going into the winter season. Our plan does address that. Pastor Maxwell and the landscape architect and landscape contractor will address that. And finally, the plan has to be reasonable and, it, and enhance the buffer zone. This plan does enhance the buffer zone. It does not destroy it. And I think the committee simply needs to know there's, not one, there's no way you can 100% re restore that buffer, but our plan reasonably restores the buffer. It's not based on an arbitrary number. It's not based on arbitrary decisions. It's based on the experience and the uh, and recommendations of our expert who is our landscape architect. 
And we think that our plan does comply with the manual and we think that it is not an arbitrary decision and we think that the committee should accept the plan that Lake Providence has presented today uh, that it be allowed to restore those trees, restore the buffer with 230 caliper inches or a total of, I think that's 90, 612, 222, 92, 92 trees because we think it reasonably does restore the buffer zone. Thank you, sir. Thank Appreciate you. that. Appreciate you uh, staying under the time limit. Thank you. All right. So if you all will, uh, if you don't mind turning off your mics, uh, just so we won't hear the table noise. Uh, and uh, at this time, uh, just to follow our procedure, we want to open it up for a public uh, comment period, see if there's anyone here who'd like to speak. Uh, uh, either for or against uh, the proposal that's been discussed here so far. Of course, we'll have some additional clarification. We've already passed one motion in regard to this case that we'll revisit here in a minute, as well as the previous um, uh, uh, conditions that were set from our previous uh, uh, granting of a, of a variance. So we'll clarify all those details as well. So is anyone here who'd like to speak in favor of the current proposal? All right, seeing none, anyone here would like to speak in opposition to the current variance proposal? All right, seeing none, do we have any uh, emails or letters or phone calls? There were no, no emails on this case. Okay, all right. So seeing that we have no additional public comment and no written or verbal comments have been filed, we'll close the public hearing at this point. So this is the part of the public hearing process where the committee members debate uh, what's been presented and uh, since it's my job to help the committee stay up to speed with our progress of this discussion i've got a couple of quick questions that i think will help um, can you remind us what we passed at our previous meeting where i i think we set the cumulative inches uh, uh, as a requirement of the board's previous decision can you tell us what remind us what that was if I'm not mistaken I, I think we passed a motion that said that they had to meet the second compromise that staff presented am I remembering that correctly Okay. And okay. I agree with that as well. However, I did speak to Mr. Hunt and I thought that your motion went beyond what we were asking for. Because if you were asking us to simply go and accept the number that they gave us, then there was nothing else for us to do other than accept the second number. Yes, sir. I, I, I remember our motion was that the minimum floor for the renegotiation would be 268 cumulative inches that's that's my understanding and then I think the negotiation part was how that would be distributed across the site okay I see heads nodding okay and we at, 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 and unfortunately uh, you can appeal decisions to yeah, a higher sure. legal level after we've made a decision so it, it it appears to me that we've made the decision about the cumulative inches uh, the, the issue is where that's going to be distributed on the landscape and then what degree and what, what plant species are picked. And I, and I think that was your landscape architect's job to do that. Now, if, if I'm remembering that incorrectly, somebody, somebody let me know, but I don't think I am. My recollection is in working with the church, we had um, also offered as part of compromise some um, that they could plant trees in additional areas maybe outside of the repairing area That's part of as the well distribution. was my yeah. recollection. And that yeah. was part of, you know, the go yes. back and think about. Yeah, that was part of that distribution concept that I think we were, we were trying to create some flexibility for. So, the, so that's where we stand on the current uh, cumulative inches of trees and where we stand in terms of flexibility for the distribution of the plantings. Um, can someone give us an update on the status of the prior variance and how this uh, proposal changes the prior variance that they have? Um, 
maybe I'll, I'll defer to Liz and Rebecca, but my general inclination is they're not asking to do anything beyond what was in the original variance of 2002. They, in that variance, were granted the ability to take out some trees down to the level stated there and be able to maintain the buffer to top of bank, but to leave top of bank to water level alone. And I think they're still uh, proposing to do that. Uh, yeah, so that. Okay. Okay, because right. so, I know that came up in the prior meeting, Michael. I think you brought that up about the prior variance needing to be right. We were we to. wanted to make sure that the because what really governs this site at this point is not the stormwater management manual; it's the variance they got in two thousand and two. Yes. So really, yes. anything they do is going to need a variance from from this committee okay. to go forward. At which point that becomes what governs the site into the future and okay. the level of buffer that will need to be maintained. Okay. All right. And okay. From, so from this Liz's is research this is, on the original. We went ahead and added those numbers up there. The original tree count from the from the 2002 variance was 145. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So it 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 appears there's been a fairly significant compromise made to uh, replace what was lost, um, and it appears that we voted once on on requesting that at least 268 cumulative inches be planted on the site. Now, where on the site you plant was the flexible uh, uh, opportunity. And so it, it, it sounds like there's still some disagreement with the minimum number of cumulative inches from what you all presented today. Uh, wow. Let me say that is correct. And uh, when we were here, I believe in July, uh, we, we had submitted another plan. It was my understanding from Metro, uh, Mr. Hunt, that they were not going to oppose our recommendation for the, the, the increased number of trees that we had come up to at that time, or, or the increased number of inches, which was the 230. And um, Mr. Hunt may, uh, may recall us saying that, uh, speaking outside there. Um. My recollection is, obviously, this, this is a unique case. We don't see this very often. Unfortunately, we've just seen another one happen where they've taken down and, and now we're having to go through this same process. Um, we did use a metro restoration standard as the initial metric in this. Uh, we talked to the, to the church. They do have some, some external or extenuating issues. They've got a TDOT project. Um, and some other things going on. So we've worked with them to whittle down now to the compromise level. And as he mentioned, we even went down and let them modify the inches further if they would guarantee 100% survivability. So they, they got that. And we, where we sort of are now, we're in this issue where we've gone as far from a standardization, what we would tell anybody to do in this sort of situation, as uh, far as we feel like we can go to have a standardized response to these and then what they're saying they can do on their site given their site situation. So are you all uh, saying yeah. that you do accept their current proposal of 92 we, trees and 230 cumulative inches? We would we would stick with the 268 just from a standardization okay. standpoint that's, and if I they have hardship <laughs> such that yeah. the 230 would be appropriate then this body okay. would be the body to step in and grant okay. that allowance. Okay. In our opinion. And my understanding was that if this body did elect to step in and accept the 230, that they were not going to oppose that. That's what Mr. Hunt told me okay. in July. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're used to that. Okay, so, so well, what is, we, we're used to it too, but, <laughs> yes. but, but we want to, we're not just asking that it be done, we're asking that you accept the 230 because it complies with yes, what sir. the manual tells us we have to do. Our <clears> landscape <throat> architect has reasonably put something forward that attempts to restore the buffer. Okay, yes, sir. Well, I, it, it ultimately comes down to the will of the committee. And uh, so, uh, what do you all think? Um, I could, whoever. Who's going okay. first? You, you, okay. You, you Am I on? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I guess the first thing I want to say is that uh, you'd mentioned, you know, going to the site. We can't really do that. If we did that, we'd all have to do that. If individually we went out there and looked at it, that gives one of us more knowledge than the rest, and we really can't do that. So 
we're not going to bust and go look at this. Another thing you said was something about how beautiful it could be. It's not about that either. This is about restoration of a stream that was damaged. And so I guess my question is uh, to staff maybe, because I can't tell really at looking at this sketch, the buffer is not indicated. Do we know how many trees are being planted outside of the buffer based upon this plan? Is there a way for us to know that? My understanding is none of them are being planted outside of the buffer. So I guess if you look at the little dotted line on the plan, mm -hmm. um, it's my inference that that is the stream. So um, I everything back to that line, that solid line, there's a wall there, and then parking sits above that. So all of that is within their allotted buffer. Okay, so although we gave them flexibility, I guess, previously to plant outside the buffer, they've actually based upon what you're saying, it looks like they're totally planted within the buffer. So that's, I think that's beneficial. Um, the fact that you said you would ensure 100% survivability, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of liability right there. But I mean, I think I would take that in consideration as well. Yes. So that's all I really have to say. Uh, I'm just gonna list everybody else, thank you. All right, any other discussion? Uh, I, I'd, I'd like Mr. to build Sandu. on Mr. Hunt's perspective that brought some clarity for me at least and one of the things that comes to my mind is um, you know the square footage of or the area of disturbance doesn't equal um, the area of, of mitigation here okay the trees the buffer was disturbed on both sides of the of the creek we're only putting back trees on 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 one side here and I understand that TDOT has plans to widen Nolensville Road in this area. Well, let us correct you, sir. It wasn't disturbed on both sides of the creek. All okay. the trees that were cut down were on the side of the, as you see here on the drawing, they were all back on this side over here. Oh, I'm um, misspoken then. Correct. Okay, I take back that statement. So there were no trees on, see, I saw this photo. Yeah, I think there was like four trees uh, because we submitted pictures uh, before and after. So there were like four trees that were cut that were close to this this side of the street and as you can see those four trees there one two three four that's the part that is being taken by TDOT because they're going to widen the road into that area so the only way we can restore is on the back side of the creek there as you see which is what our plan takes into account okay so where I was headed was and th thank you for the clarification trying to boil this down to the essence of the issue. The essence of the issue, in my opinion, is restoring the stream buffer such that it is stabilized. Correct. And so are we effectively doing that with this plan? And that's that's kind of where I am with this issue is, is do we feel as a committee this is adequate mitigation for the disturbance that was done within this buffer to stabilize this this bank? And that's, in my opinion, also a, a staff, a staff question. You know, do you, does the staff feel as though that this is adequate the, the staff, um, it, as I understand, the staff uh, came up with compromise number two, 268 cumulative inches, and the number of trees as stated there next to it, uh, as a compromise for mitigation. Um, but, and whether or not that's adequate uh, for to replace 87 tr trees at 1,554 cumulative inches, you know, is uh, a little arbitrary because we don't have a specific um, codified requirement for mitigation, one-to-one um, uh, -one mitigation or ten-to-one mitigation. It's it's been a it's been a bit of a uh, qualitative exercise, and so. Uh, but if if we were to go down to a quantitative exercise, I would say it does not. Yeah. But staff has a uh, has proposed 268 cumulative inches here, and they're wanting 230. So I think staff's opinion is pretty clear. But what staff has said, if we want to accept their proposal, we'd be accepting something other than the minimum that staff recommended. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Galbraith, but did I understand you to say that if you go down to a quantitative uh, measure, you don't think that 230 Adequately, 268 would not either, sir. Yeah, that's and, and I think that's where we are. I think the what we're saying is that 268 is an arbitrary number. But if you ask the staff the questions according to the regulations, the regulations say that we must stabilize 
the bank. We must put in gra grass that will prevent erosion. We must put in the number of trees that attempt to restore the buffer, which are all the things that we went through here. We must put in trees that attempt to enhance it, and we must provide two years of survival, but we've, we're providing 100%, uh, and it also says that it must attempt to restore the buffer zone. As we said, there is no particular number that is going to 100% restore that buffer zone. Uh, but sir, we must uh, do what's reasonable, and the regulations tell us in terms of determining what's reasonable, we have to rely on the experts, our landscape architect. Yes, sir. Metro uh, has never said to us that these numbers they give us do restore the buffer, do, do stabilize the bank, do prevent erosion of the soil. They've never said that to us. All they've done is given us a number and said, this is what we want you to do. Yes, sir. It's, I, I, I can confirm that, that the number that they have offered you as a compromise is arbitrarily low. Yes. And, if it, and the standard, if you want to talk about a true standard of what you just described, the regulation seeks, the standard is to go out to a least disturbed site in the environment and to count the number of stems, the number of trees on the site, to count the caliber inches represented on that site, and I guarantee you it would be way higher than this. It's the 1554 that you see up top It'd there. be way higher than that, sir. Oh, that's right. You take the 87. Yes, we, we know how it's done. Uh, it's the good, good Lord does a lot better job protecting streams than yes, we do, as I, think, <laughs> as I think your pastor agrees. So, so this is a pretty um, uh, arbitrarily low compromise. Sure. And so um, I, I guess, you know, we've already made a decision that we'd like you to stick to the second compromise. The question is, where do you want to plant them and how do you want to plant them? Well, Mr. Gabbard, I, I have to respectfully disagree. You may have made your decision, but as Mr. Hunt has stated today, that they are willing to accept what this committee will do. Yes, and if sir. If this that, committee is willing to say the 230, that, that, means, to a vote. that means we'd have to change our mind. Exactly. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, so does the committee want to change their mind, or do you all want to stick with what we've already done? So, uh, that's really the bottom line. Yeah. I made of this, this um, the discussion or the, the reasoning behind the 230 um, and why we couldn't get it to the 30 the other 38 inches. Um, and if I if you've said that before, is it for, because of TDOT or what's the no, ma'am? Because because of cost, cost is one, is one factor that we're taking into consideration here. Uh, based on the numbers that they want, we're looking at a fifty, sixty thousand dollar project. Based on what we're pro proposing to put in, it's really a twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar project. So, to to do what they want us to do is going to cost the, the church an additional twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Okay, thank you. Staff question. Okay, am I right about that? Got any other comments? Oh, just questions? another question, just All right, Mr. Somewhat, somewhat related. So, uh, if the state Absent of anything have occurred here and all these trees remain, and the state did a project that removed a bunch of trees, would we require the state to, to mitigate that? Are you talking about on state right-of-way? Yeah, well, I mean, let's say the state, it's not within the right-of-way, but maybe they have to expand, or maybe it is within the right-of-way. They, they have sovereign immunity. They would? To local regulations. Okay. As well as National Public Works. Okay, well, I guess... From my perspective, I'm not sure why you would take on a mission to do this many trees with 100% survivability. I think that's going to cost you. You're not going to get 100% survivability. I know this. I've planted 400 trees before, and I know how this works. So I, I'll speak a little bit about that survivability percentage. Um, we, we came to that because of our second compromise. Um, they wanted a lower cumulative inches number. And so in order to give them that, we gave them the 25% die off at the front end so that they had to guarantee 100% survivability of what they did plant after that, which is how we got to this 100% survivability okay. percentage. Okay. I, I couldn't hear real well. So was the 100% survivability for the 268 uh, 
Do you, you, closer to the mic. So on our second compromise that we presented to them, mm -hmm. we gave them a 25% um, survivability uh, die off at the beginning. So technically whenever you plant, we give a 25% die off for the plants that are planted. But because they wanted a lower number, or I guess because we were trying to get them to a lower number, we gave them that percentage at the front end, which got them to the 268 cumulative inches, but they had to guarantee 100% survivability. Okay. Okay. So, sounds to me like the short answer is yes. <laughs> okay, so where are we, folks? I mean, I agree with Mr. Dale. Let's. I, I, I can say this. You know, the reason that public Metro Public Works and the State Highway Department are granted that type of exemption is that is that. Is that the basis for your concern? Because they do not impact the landscape the way buildings do. We build a lot more buildings than we build roads. We build a lot more human structures than we build pipes. So public works and highway departments have a lower impact on the landscape than we do as human beings. And that's why we regulate them differently. I, I'm not saying it's fair. I remember a day when TDOT had to mitigate any wetland that they destroyed 10 to 1. And I think that's still the case, but with stream buffers, for some reason, our policymakers have chosen to allow our infrastructure agencies not to follow that rule. Right that's now, public policy requires people who have dwellings near streams that they leave the buffers intact or that they mitigate them when they damage them. And that's the public policy we're charged with addressing today. May I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, because I want to know, are there other entities that are exempt of this altogether? Because if you go north of our site, it's an AT&T service center or something down there just below us. That buffer has been cleared for years. And they cleared out the stream. They keep it cut. It's gorgeous. It's just about three trees in there. But they have not been told, I guess, to restore anything in there. And it's the same Whittemore branch. And I'm wondering why do they not have to restore the buffer that was once overgrown? And I'm wondering if it's a grandfather deal and who's their granddaddy. We'll be, we'll be glad to check that out. <laughs> Thanks, sir. I can't answer oh, that, but okay. are, are there any other mitigation efforts outside of trees that, that they could do? What, what, what are the other pieces here, is, uh, outside of trees? I'm not 100% familiar with the site, but I guess they could enhance a detention pond or they could do some other activity. I guess we were focused, since the variance was clear on uh, the number of trees in the buffer, focusing on, on that aspect of it at this point. Um, I, one other thing I will add about buffers and public departments of transportation. The buffer contemplates uh, community safety. So to establish safe sight lines at intersections and roadways and so as to not have trees in certain locations, that's built into the regulations and, and that, that work can be done. And that's, and that's why these kind of compromises near roads and near driveways, major thoroughfares going into a church, allows for a lower number of trees. All right, that's what's the point. will of the committee? I feel like we're beating a dead horse. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry, I didn't, he I didn't hear what I'm you sorry. said. I'm sorry, I just sort of feel like we're beating a dead horse. I'm probably particularly frustrated today. I'm tired. <laughs> and I'm, I'm tired of dealing with government, quite honestly, too. But it's not their fault. We take so much time. It takes staff a lot of time to deal with this stuff. And look at this. We've dealt with this forever. I, so, I, um, so I think that what the staff had presented you was reasonable. I think this committee had suggested that this is what you do. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to offer a different point of discussion between the committee. Would you like to put that in the form of a motion? No, just this discussion, I think, because I don't want to say, I don't want to recommend something that people wouldn't support. 
So um, I'm curious if we could not require them to build the 268 cubic inches, but ensure survivability of 230. I don't think there's any way you're going to build something and get 100%. You're going to wind up doing this anyway. I promise you. Yeah. So uh, that would be sort of an in-between. You, you would be planning 268 caliper inches or cumulative inches, but you would only have to survive 230. And so that that's like a 90% or 90, 90. Yeah, 80. Exactly. I think that's doable. Would that be acceptable to no, you? No, I can tell you not. That, that, well, that's not that, that that's not acceptable. Okay. I think, Mr. Well, Mr. Sorry. Dale, with all due respect, I think, I think when that's you all say, we can do. Mr. Dale, with all due respect, I think when you say, you know, you're tired of this and it's government, mm. I think that's why the regulations require us to, re to, to look to the experts. The regulations required us to rely upon what a landscape mm -hmm. architect believes to be reasonable because we're not landscape architects. You're not landscape designers. You don't do this and I don't do it either. Okay. Well, this is right. not a debate so, right hang now. Hang on, Mr. Dale. Okay. Let me, let me, let me, this is let not me a debate. This is it's not a, it's sir, not a debate, sir. But, sir, but, sir, if, but sir, if the uh, committee's position we, is what it is, then we, we understand our appeal rights. Something like this, I promise you. We understand our appeal rights. Okay. Thanks, sir. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, going back to the essence of the issue, the reasonable uh, buffer disturbance mitigation effort, you know, does this plan, it's dense, a lot of trees on this one side of the bank. All right. As these trees grow up, it's, it's going to be, um, you're not going to be able to see your charge, <laughs> which is okay. But I mean, it's, it's a dense plan. This is a dense landscape plan. It's a lot of trees in this area. The reason why that the tree count is so high is because of the old growth. They had some big trees in that photo, large caliper trees. The equivalent to those to the smaller two-inch trees is this quantity. So I'd, I'd, I'd just like to add uh, something to help clarify one point, and, and sir, we're, um, we're getting close to making a decision. Sure. When Mr. Hunt told you that they would accept the board's decision, that's because they have to, because we make the final decision. So that doesn't mean it's the best compromise. Okay. So uh, does anyone have a motion? So I, I will say this. I, I, my motion is going to be that I make a motion that we stick with the recommendations of Stormwater Staff Committee for the 268 um, inches. And the reason why is because it is what policy and it's the decision that the committee had made previously coming in. I think there has, has been some t form of compromise, but when we talk about experts, and I think I'm rambling now, and then the staff has are the experts on our end and who we also look to when we make these decisions. So um, my motion is to stay with, um, stick with the, the recommendations from the staff and go with the 268 human adventures. Okay. Can I ask a legal question? I, I was about to ask the same thing, but please do it. Okay. How many uh, are, we just have a form right now? Yes. So yes. yes. We need to vote. Uh, we, we can vote when we get a second. Okay. I want to make sure everybody knows that what I'm voting on is based upon logic, not based on my frustration with me. Okay, the statement I made, I want to make sure you understand that. It has nothing to do with that. Um, but I'm agreeing with uh, my colleague based upon the merits of the case. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. All right, motion has been made and properly seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion? The motion is to uh, require the second compromise of 268 cumulative inches. Uh, and the number of trees that have been specified. Uh, was there anything about survivability in that motion? I didn't hear that. Did you want to? Uh, did you want to accept Mr. Dale's survivability? Um, the just the 230. The uh, there's survivability right. The 100 percent of yeah. 230 that, that needs to be in there. That needs to be in. There. Yes, I was. I accept okay, that. then we'll take that up in, in, as an amendment in just a minute. Okay, all right. So we have a motion made and properly seconded. So let's take up the amendment. So would someone like to make an amendment that we add the survivability that Mr. Dale described? I would. Um, I'd like to uh, make an amendment that we ensure survivability of 230 cumulative inches. For, for how long? 
that we're not discussing this. This, this is this 100%. 100%. 230, we're, we're going to plant 268 cumulative inches, and we're going to ensure survivability of 230 inches, okay. whatever percentage that works out to be. Okay. Okay, so that's the motion. Do we have a second on the amendment? I second. All right, motion been made, properly seconded. Is there any discussion on the amendment at this time on the survivability? We're, we're requiring survivability of 230 cumulative inches of the 268 compromise level. All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. All right, motion, the amendment passes on the motion, so we're back to the original motion. The original motion is that uh, now, as amended, that we require the 268 cumulative inches with a survivability of 100% for 230 cumulative inches. We have a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye on the amendment. Okay, so we have a unanimous decision. Motion's passed as amended. Thank you for coming today, gentlemen. I hope that compromise helps. Sure. Can you just tell me how many people actually And, and sir, we've got to move on. We, we yeah, can't. I just want the vote number. What was the vote it's, number? It's uh, four, uh, four, four on the uh, motion as amended, three to one on the mo on the amendment three to the one. motion. Okay, yes, thank you. Does that help you? Yeah, it does. Right. Thanks, sir. That works. All right, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, sir. Okay. If our second applicants would like to come forward, uh, we're going to go through the same administrative process. Um, we're going to ask you to uh, make about a 10-minute presentation. What's that? The second case? Oh, it's, it's on the agenda, so I thought you all knew. Uh, it is uh, Sugar Tree Road. Oh, Temple Road, excuse me, 5952 Temple Road. So those folks who are representing 5952 Temple Road, if you'll come forward and just be patient with us while we get set up and go through our various administrative processes. And if you'll just click off that mic right there for me, thank you. Just one time, there you go. Whoops. Okay. It's okay. Now we're back in business. Okay. So if uh, stormwater staff, uh, we're, we're, did you all hear the legal statement that was read at the beginning? Okay. All right. So if stormwater staff would introduce the case, we'll proceed with our administrative review. Case number two on the agenda is case 2021 0001. 5952 Temple Road at 5952 Temple Road. APN is 156-0000-9900. Inspector is Logan Bowman. Council District 35, Dave Ro Rosenberg. Applicants request allow finished floor elevation to remain at current height. The appellant is Katie Dozier, represented by Brian Hamilton of Nashville Civil. Comments, stormwater staff. Staff recommends that the requirements of the stormwater management regulations be upheld for this case that requires substantially damaged property to comply with all floodplain requirements, including elevating the building as required by the stormwater management manual. Additionally, staff is concerned that the perceived hardship requiring this variance is not based on a unique physical and topographical condition of the property, rather due to an individual personal circumstance of the applicant, and therefore not eligible for a variance to the stormwater management manual regulations. Code said no comment provided, Planning, base zoning, planning comments not applicable, and Greenways had no comment provided. Okay, so our uh, case has been properly introduced. Folks will have uh, 10 minutes to uh, describe your variant proposal and then open it up to public for folks who want to speak for or against, and then they'll begin our directions. All right, if you please introduce yourself and any resource uh, professional that you may have that can help us understand your.
Yeah, it was blinking the last time, I guess. All right. So thank you. Um, we understand the regulations for the finished floor elevation. However, we disagree with the staff decision because this property is an existing structure and not a proposed structure. To have that requirement on a new subdivision or new homes is understandable. The structure we're discussing was elevated according to the former flood elevation. That owner passed away before work was complete and Ms. Dozier became the owner and was unaware that the new flood elevation re would require another raising of the structure. So we believe this committee has the authority and foresight to grant the, this existing structure to remain at three feet above the current flood elevation. So we've got the package, I guess you're probably seeing it on up there. Um, that's an elevation certificate. But we've got a mitigation plan also that was talked about in the pre-application conference, uh, just showing a few trees back there. And I get, we've uh, abided by everything in the checklist, and we just um, think that this structure could remain at three feet above. Okay, would you like to say anything else if you turn on your mic, ma'am, and introduce yourself? Sorry. That's okay. I'm Katie Dozier. I'm the homeowner. Yeah, I just, I bought this home, you know, without the knowledge that there had been a floodplain change. I mean, I had no knowledge. The previous owner apparently didn't have the knowledge. So when we applied for permit, this came to light. It was a very lengthy process, but when it did, you know, come to light that it was one foot below the new flood map, I guess 100-year flood, uh, you know, they require, saying that I required, am required to elevate it another foot. Um, this, this home had been permitted in 2012, and had it been completed then, it would sit as it is now, you know, inhabited at the current level that it is, at the current elevation. So I just, and then there are several homes on my block in the same exact situation. So I understand the new floodplain and the requirement, you know, that goes along with it. It just doesn't, with the current situation, with the homes that are there now, it just, I don't, I don't really understand the need to enforce it at this point, I guess. Okay, all right. Is that uh, your entire proposal, testimony? I suppose. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and, and we'll come back to you for okay. questions. It's, it's just kind of an efficiency matter. Yes, so. thanks. Right, thank you very much. All right, is there anyone here who would like to speak in uh, favor of the current variance proposal? Anyone here who would like to speak uh, in opposition? Okay, do we have any emails, voicemails, letters, council representative comments? We, we did not. I did uh, speak on the phone to a neighbor. They didn't give opposition or support, but it was just curiosity. And I guess their house was built around a similar time, and they just asked some questions about floodplain regulations. So. Okay, all right. So seeing that we don't have any other public comment, uh, we'll close the public hearing. And at this time, uh, we'll begin our deliberation. Um, and I, th I think the facts are pretty clear to me. Uh, okay, so uh, <clears throat> Mr. Dale's gonna ask you a few questions. Well, I'm, I'm, that's a question for staff probably. So what was the triggering event of this raising of the finished floor elevation? Is this, is this, are we on the right case to build a garage? Is, this, this, is that the case we're on? Oh, so we skipped over that. I'm confused. Okay. Yeah, sorry, we, so we skipped. Number okay. Yeah. Now. <laughs> okay. There, there's a pretty. There's a pretty. Roger wrote a. I guess a, a pretty uh, good summary that's on the okay. tablet. All right. Uh, I've got a paper copy over here if you'd like that as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, sir. Yeah. Ro Roger's got. Yeah. Just, okay. yeah we, Roger. Roger trigger, yeah. Help us understand this, it. This review. And, and by the way, Mr. Lindsay um, has uh, quite a history of working with floodplain management issues, so he should be able to give you some insight as well, as well as give us some insight. So, so this is an unusual project, not, not the only of its kind. We've got a number of these actually going on right now as well. So the house at 5929 Temple Road was severely flooded during the May 2010 flood, 
it was deemed to be substantially damaged and in accordance with the definition for FEMA for substantially damaged projects, um, if the structure is damaged by more than 50% of the value of the house at the time of the event, it has to be brought into compliance with the floodplain requirements. Uh, the direction that was given to that previous homeowner in 2011 or 12 when it was permitted was to elevate the house to meet the floodplain standards, specifically the four-foot freeboard requirement. The effective maps at the time of the 2010 flood identified a base flood elevation of 564.0 feet based on the 1929 datum and the main living level identified by the elevation certificate was 567.7 feet. There are a couple of issues at play during that initial effort to repair. One, that first living level is a level above a full basement. Uh, defined by the level, if, if so, if that first living level is defined by where the front door is, the house was 33.7 feet above the base flood elevation or 0.3 feet short of our four-foot freeboard. Um, so I, also, I mentioned the house being built over a full walkout basement. Uh, there's a two-car parking enclosure below that level, in that level. Um, that basement cannot be restored as usable living space because the floor level of that basement is nearly five feet below the base flood elevation. So any approval to restore the property has to contain a requirement for a non-conversion agreement prohibiting the creation of any living space in that basement. So the owner of the home at that time set out to elevate the house without really elevating the house. As I understand it, working evenings and weekends, he cut out the subfloor in between the floor joists, nailed a new two by four to the top of each floor joist, and then installed new subflooring on top of that two by four, and then replaced the wall framing. He then set about to raise the ceiling height by creating tray ceilings in each of the rooms in order to maintain that ceiling height as, as would be required by codes. So in a tragic twist to this narrative, the owner, well short of finishing his restoration, was killed in a motorcycle accident, and the house has stood unfinished and empty for more than 10 years. Ms. Dozier purchased the home in the spring of this year with the intent of either rehabbing for sale or as a personal residence. So complicating this story is the fact that the flood maps have now changed. They changed in 2017, so they've been in place now for for at least four years, uh, taking effect in April of 2017. Those are the new effective flood insurance rate maps. The base flood elevation, which impacts this entire reach of the road from this house further downstream going north, uh, is impacted by the backwaters of the, of the Harpeth River. So when the Harpeth River is at flood stage, that water backs all the way up that street to, one, to, to this house and a, I think a house beyond that. So the base flood elevation increased by a half a foot, leaving the house again short of meeting the four foot freeboard defined by the ordinance. It remains substantially damaged from that 2010 flood, totally stripped of all drywall, both walls and ceilings, no insulation, neither in walls or attics, no mechanicals, cabinets, bathroom fixtures. There's nothing in here. This is a framed house with brick around it and a roof on top. The basis for my direction uh, to Ms. Dozier in the, is the stormwater regulations in section 5.5 under specific standards where the two of these following statements are contained. One is that all residential construction shall be elevated such that the lowest floor is no lower than four feet above the base flood elevation. And also the concluding statement in that section is improvements to buildings valued at more than 50% of the building's pre-improvement value are considered substantial improvements and therefore must comply with all floodplain requirements, including elevating the building as required in this chapter. Of course, the language in that section as it relates to substantial improvement is also, as defined in our regulations, substantial improvement, providing improvements to a structure that's been damaged by a flood is the same as substantial damage. So damaged by more than 50% or, as, as stated in that, uh, that you've got to bring it into compliance with the floodplain ordinance. 
During our discussion uh, with Ms. Dozier, we requested that she provide a new elevation certificate that accounted for the change in the base flood elevation, as well as the change from the old 1929 datum to the present 1988 datum, which is a, a nominal amount in Middle Tennessee. So the elevation certificate, which pre was prepared by Jesse Walker, who's a local registered land surveyor and a, a registered professional engineer, shows that the current base flood elevation is 564.5, and the top of the first living level is 567.5 for a freeboard of 3, 3.0 feet. So it's still one full foot short of the required four foot freeboard. Um, compounding the issues with this property during March the 27th and 28th extreme rain event, the house was again impacted. There was roughly three feet of water backed up from Trace Creek. Um, into the basement of this structure. So um, our concern is, one, that it, it remains a structure that's subject to um, flooding from extreme events. Um, the other, I guess, um, issue that, w that we deal with on somewhat of a regular basis is we, we continue to see homes that are renovated post-flood, uh, in a lot of cases by investors, with the intent of flipping to a new owner who ends up owning without understanding. And I think that's that's kind of a similar case with Ms. Dozier that, that uh, so, okay. So anyway, staff recommends that the requirements um, should be upheld for this case, that requiring a substantially damaged property to comply with all of the floodplain requirements, including elevating the building as required by the stormwater manual um, additionally, uh, the, the issues related to the hardship, as it's defined in FEMA's hardship uh, manual, is that the ver of any variance request has to be based on a unique physical and topographical condition of the property rather than to an individual personal circumstance um, of the applicant and therefore not eligible for a variance. So, The, the finished floor elevation that was taken by the surveyor, was it taken with the modified floor elevation where it had been raised, Arch, or was it? It was based on, it was based on that level that had been had created had been raised by already. that previous owner okay. where, he, where he nailed on a two before uh -huh. and put a new subfloor on. Okay, so. perfect. That's what I wanted to know. So in Thank essence, you. that it was elevated by the, the, the thickness of a two by four yeah. and the three quarter inch subfloor on top of that, okay. two and a quarter inches. So even that after inch. that, now we're at three feet. It's still a foot short. Okay, right. thank you. Can you uh, cut off your mic there, Roger, please? Okay, so in, in short, um, these base flood elevations are based upon a 100 year frequency storm event, which has about a 1% chance of occurring in 100 years, doesn't mean it only occurs one time in 100 years, it just has a 1% chance. We're seeing more frequent, bigger storms than that. So essentially, what this is designed to do is to protect the taxpayers from having to invest in emergency services, bailout services, property repair services from folks who continue to develop in floodplains that, that flood um, at, a, uh, at a level that is becoming uh, more frequent than it used to. Do we have a 500-year elevation on this one, Roger? Is there a 500-year elevation on this? Oh, he made a reference to the 2010 flood. Does anybody have any pictures of that, curious. too? Yeah, I just didn't know if you had, if you knew what the 500-year elevation was. If we don't have it, it's okay. Yeah, we're very sorry that you, you find yourself in this situation. Yes, ma'am. I do have a question. Yes, ma'am. When the flood map changed in 2017, um, whose responsibility is it to notify the homeowner at that time that it had changed, which would significantly impact a future sale or even the safety of that homeowner? And was it done? Roger, you, you want to answer that? He's uh, associated with National Floodplain sure. Manager Association. Yeah, the requirements after the release of new flood maps are, are for the planning department to make notifications to structures that um, that were either mapped in or mapped out. Um, 
um, th that may have been impacted by the new the new maps. And I, I don't know that there that there's a, for a structure that's already fully in the floodplain that there's a, a, any requirement that says you know, the elevation at your house has changed by some number of feet. It's typically people that are impacted now, perhaps, under a new map that may not have been impacted prior to the change in maps. Uh, and that's something you'll see going forward. We've got a number of new map panels that are in the process of being issued, and we have a lot of homeowners to notify that they're in the floodplain now, where they maybe previously were not in the floodplain. So. That, that answer your question? And it, it sounds like there may have been some disclosure issues between the realtor and you and the previous owner. Is that fair? I, I don't know that the owner was aware, and I okay. haven't ever, you know, pursued that. But uh, okay. I certainly wasn't aware, and I was just curious if they were notified, if there's a formal way to notify, because it seems yeah. that it's pretty crucial, you know, that they would have been notified. We've, we've actually seen similar situations to this before. We had an applicant come before us one time. They were out of state. They bought a property that was undeveloped on the Cumberland River. Uh, they did not know that it was in a in a flood way, and uh, they put quite a bit of money down on it. And they came to us and asked for a variance. And unfortunately, we had to turn it down because if we had granted their variance, that meant other people who had had to invest money to meet protective of flood requirements. These are not just government requirements; they're designed to protect your property in the kind of flood that's becoming pretty frequent these days. Sure, I, I, I know, I understand that. It's definitely, the heavy rains are definitely more frequent. I just, taking into consideration the fact that there are other houses exactly in the same situation that I'm in. So, and there they sit at their current elevation. And that's where I struggle to understand the need to enforce it at this particular time. Were there another catastrophic flood and we were all flooded and everyone had to pursue permits? then that would be the time to address that each one of these homes has to come into compliance or be demolished. But at this time, there we all sit, but I'm unable to finish yeah. the rebuild. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's, I understand it's a grandfathering process. And, and right, and, we, and do I qualify for that? Um, unfortunately, what triggers it is, the, is your development proposal. Okay, to an existing structure. Yes, ma'am. That's that's typically when we switch from a grandfather state to a regulated state. Mm -hmm. Is we, we let people experience the risk that they're in, but when they when they go to improve the structure at a level that triggers the regulations, that's when we are obligated to require people to come in compliance because they have money on the table. They're about to add things to the site that could break loose and blow downstream and hurt somebody else's property and that's typically why we tr it gets triggered during that process although i'm not adding anything external this is strictly you know yes ma'am rebuilding the internal structure yes ma'am so. yeah unfortunately the uh, I, I understand your predicament all right what's the will of the committee we do, we do have to make a decision <laughs> up or down i'll tell you uh the reason I asked about the 500-year elevation is because um, if the 500-year elevation was like inches or a foot above the 100-year elevation, that's something I think the, I could consider, but I don't have that information. Uh, so I just want to throw that out there. We can find that. You want to find that? Yes, sir. That, well, I, I, you know, that's my thought. If the committee, you know, we don't want to think that way, I'm, we may waste our time, but... It only takes one of us. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> so, but I mean, I, we, I think we've done that. I've done, I know we've done that before. If you're on the Cumberland River and the 500-year elevation is just a foot above the 100-year elevation, then there may be the basis of granting some kind of relief. But even then, uh, I, would almost, I would want to see some other form of mitigation as well, maybe by elevating AC units or, or things like that. A, to a higher level, you know, perhaps. But uh, I just want to know what that difference of elevation is. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they had proposed, although I have a lot of trees already along the bank of the creek, but... I wouldn't be talking about that. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about forms of protecting Raising the house structures. so that if, if there's another flood, it reduces the, the amount of damage. No, I mean, that, that, that was part of the plan already.
FEMA does not want to talk to us today. It's refusing to load. <laughs> okay. What are we talking about? I guess just if the homeowner decides to sell, Ms. Doja decides to then sell this property, we will be triggered again if another end of, another homeowner or buyer comes in and requesting the same thing. So I get, that's kind of where my, my, where my head is going at the moment, is that this is, will be really a domino effect. If you ever just, you can, this can, may be your forever can home, be I don't kicked know. Down the road. If not, we're repeating the same, and we will be requesting the same, if not more, from the next homeowner. I want to make sure I got my facts straight. In building on Mr. Dale's topic of what triggered this, uh, the, the applicant is needing to uh, finish an interior build out of this home that was partially completed 10 years ago. And there's no modification to the footprint of this home with that renovation. Okay. And the raising of the floor was completed or not completed? Yes, it was completed. And, it and actually, the engineer that did the survey didn't even take that into note. He, it, he did not have that in his record. I had to have him come out to the house and observe it. So the finished floor elevation that's shown on your site plan right now is representative of the survey data from him? So there was an elevation certificate, and it had that. And, and that is reflected on that site plan that I drew. Okay. Yes. The, ele the elevated to show three feet above the current flood elevation. But at the time, it was, it met the regulations before the change. So it meets the 2010 flood map, or excuse me, not 2010, or is, is that correct? 2010 flood map. It met that. 2001 flood map, excuse me. Yes, at that time, until 2017. I guess my question would be, ma'am, if. You know, by your own admission, these floods are becoming more frequent. Uh, why would you want to um, keep it at, it at its current elevation if you know it's going to be more vulnerable to flooding, according to the flood map? I mean, I, I would love to elevate it. It is a substantial uh, undertaking and mm -hmm. a, a lot of possible damage. There's just multiple factors with that. So, and, and also, the, um, and I know that finance is not a part of it because Metro doesn't participate in any other mitigation other than demolition, you know, there's no avenue there for that either. Is there, is there any way that uh, this property could be demolished and another home built in its place at a higher elevation? Not by me. And, and, <laughs> not by me. Maybe I mean, by is someone there, is it, Has anyone ever entertained an offer like that for you? I, I know properties flip around the county all the time where they remove a home and then build a proper home and yeah. they recoup the value in the increased value of the development. I don't, I don't know. You're not I, aware I of that. I don't know those possibilities. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is the current status of the home inhabitable? Okay. No, it's, it's gutted. gutted. It's gutted. It is inhabitable. That was the reason for the filing for the permit, but we need electricity. So that's what started this whole process. Well, as you can tell, we, uh, we take this responsibility very seriously. So we're going we're gonna to thoroughly consider this and try to get all the information we need, but ultimately we'll have to make a decision. So. Probably just like turn the contours on. The permit that was pulled, the scope of work that was within that permit remains the same as it does today. Excuse me, I'm sorry. The permit that was pulled for re renovation of this property, the scope of that permit, the way it was written, remains the same today? Yes, exactly. It's simply for electricity and plumbing. That's it. But you pull a, a building permit for that. We, we've tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how was the um, value of the current building established? I mean, you're, so there's a threshold here, and this threshold is that you're going to spend 50% more 
than the value of the house. Was that a close thing? Was it close? I mean... Um, no, no. I have the way that I had it figured as far as what we have to do for the renovation it will be well within the current value of the house when it's finished. No, I, I mean, I'm what sorry. triggers this is that the house, the improvements that are required on the house are 50% more than the current value of the house, right? So I want to know how, was, when you calculated the work that you were going to do and you compare it to the value of the house, was it close to 50%, well above 50%? The renovation costs, you're saying, would be more than 50% of the actual value of the home right now? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if, you, if your calculations, you could re-evaluate that somehow. If you took that existing structure and you had to rebuild that existing structure, to me, that would create, would signify a value of the existing structure and then compare that to the cost of the renovation. Yeah. If you get less than 50%, then you're not here. So it may be in your interest to ask for a deferral to go back and well, collect that information. Th th and this gets into a lot more complicated issue because the, the, the definition for, for that substantial damage goes toward, you know, the damage being at a level that, that is 50% is or more of the value of the house prior to the disaster that caused this. The original disaster, declar the original declaration of substantial damage was done by me. Um, in a letter that was dated in about 2011 or so uh, based on numbers that that previous owner had presented uh, that showed it to be more, it was like 67% damage based on the value before the flood. Okay. So, so now the house has stood um, gutted and abandoned for 11 years um, and it's it, based on all of the substantial damage determinations that we do. When you've got a house that is stripped of all interior finishes, including the, even the, the drywall and the ceilings, is gone. It's just it's just open, rough framing. Um, there's no there's no mechanicals left. There's not even an HVAC unit parked outside. It's just it's just a house that's been stripped of 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 any vestige of any internal finish. So, and, um, is this, and so yeah. it's substantially damaged. Got it. it's, so is it, is regardless this, of what... You got it. You know, and based yeah. on FEMA's definition, and okay. if you use the FEMA substantial damage software and you started keying in the fact that that none of these finishes are, are present, then then it's it's substantially damaged probably by, by more than the 60-some-odd okay. percent before. And so, that goes back to me. I mean, the only route I see, the only route I see is to compare the 500-year elevation to the finished floor elevation. That's the only the only route I see. So, Mr. Uh, the famous website's not just not opening right mm -hmm. now. So, Mr. Lindsay, would uh, <laughs> Mr. L Mr. Lindsay, would this home qualify for any kind of metro buyout? Uh, we, we've actually, I guess there have been conversations with Ms. Dozier about that, and, and we have put that project, her house, on a list uh, because we expect significant uh, uh, federal dollars in, in the next several years to, to complete buyouts. We've, we're buying already uh, 22 houses that were flooded just in March, um, but it's a, it's a long, and that's a, that's a different funded program that's funded through the Corps of Engineers. Um, the, the challenge in this case, while we agree that it's a good candidate for a buyout, um, it's, the, it's an 18 to 24 month process, I think, at, at best. Um, it's, it's a house, it's actually going in to one of the, the latest applications that we're submitting through TEMA to FEMA. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be on that list. Okay. Um, and that's, a, you know, that's an alternative, but it's a longer term alternative. And, and obviously, Ms. Dozier, had, she has to deal with, with, with mortgage payments and things like that until, yeah. until the closing of that takes place. Yeah. To your be. earlier question about, about the suitability for reconstruction, certainly a, a new structure. I mean, we, we approve structures in the floodplain all the time. They just have to meet the, the current standards, uh, including that four-foot freeboard and flood vents and all the and floodproof materials and all the things that go with, uh, with building in the floodplain. With the bay. And you could do it in a floodplain like this. You could do it mm -hmm. on a different footprint. Um, there is a clause in our regulations that addresses 
reconstruction of damaged properties that says that if you're in the flood way in the ordinance, if you're in the flood way and you're substantially damaged as a homeowner, that we will allow you to, to rebuild that that house in the floodway, a dangerous place, but in the floodway, as long as it was on the same footprint and as long as it was elevated to meet the standards. And, and, and we looked at this, we talked about it, we, we pondered this, you know, that it's one foot short of our standard. Um, and, and because the wording of the stormwater management manual is worded in the way it is, defining our regulations, the agreement that, that, that we reached with our, our legal department was that that's not a, an item that I had discretion to say, well, you're close, so let's go ahead and go. Um, it, was, it was still a foot short of the standard, and so our position as staff was that it needed to meet the standard. Okay. And I know government certainly gets its fair bad rap, but there's a whole lot of risk out there we don't regulate. and. Most of our regulations are political compromises associated with things that are well below the worst risk that's out there. So, yeah. make so sure I'm sorry. That's one reason why we deliberate these so thoroughly so the public can understand the risk. Yes, sir. Going back again, I think Mr. Dale's point earlier with some clarification was helpful for me. Um, so, what I heard was that uh, if the value of the renovation is less than 50% of the value of the home that it's in, in which it stood back in 2011 or 2010 would not trigger it to come to this committee? So it's about five feet. There's about five feet difference between the base flood elevation and the 500 year level. Right. So, so based upon that, to me, that basically says that this stream is a pretty volatile stream. You know, over a period of time, 100 year elevation could continue to rise. What I was hoping for your sake that maybe we could get you at the 500 year or one foot above the 500 year, and we're no close to that. So uh, I just don't see I could support uh, the request. Sorry. And then the, and the, uh, because it is backwater, it's backwater from the from the Harpeth River, which is just another five or six blocks up to the north, uh, going north on that uh, reach of the of Trace Creek. Uh, we know that the Harpeth River in 2010 went eight feet above base flood elevation. That's how, how deep the flood was at that point. So ma'am, uh, it's none of our business to tell you what to do personally, but sunk cost in a project that has a lot of risk um, might not be an advisable thing to add more investment to, but uh, but our our decision today has to rely upon the facts of the case and the facts of the variance proposal. So, do we have a uh, decision? I move that we deny the request. Okay, we, submitted. we have a motion that unfortunately we deny the request. Is there a second? A second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? on the motion to deny. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? I'm sorry, folks. Okay, so let's take a five minute recess. Uh, if the next um, applicant would like to come up, that would be a Sugar Tree Road, if I'm not mistaken. So we're gonna take five minutes and then we'll be right back. Okay, so Sugar Tree Road, right? Okay, 2866, case 2021-00009. Okay, so um, our standard procedure is, uh, did you all hear the legal statement that was read earlier? Okay, so you know your rights. Um, so at this time, we'll have staff introduce the case. Um, we'll give you all 10 minutes to make your proposal. Um, 
and then we'll have a public hearing for those in opposition or, or for, and then we'll have we'll start our committee discussion. So, Mr. Bowman. Case number three on the agenda is case 2021-00009-2866 Sugar Tree Road at 2866 Sugar Tree Road. APN is 117-0900-8100. Inspectors Kimberly Hayes, Council District 25, Russ Pulley. Applicants request disturbance of zone one floodway buffer of Sugar Tree Creek to build a garage. Appellant is Ryan Henderson and Aaron Brockway represented by John Richard Patterson of Kimley Horn. Comments, stormwater staff, staff requests the area behind existing landscape area be a no mow area as shown in original variants. Staff requests more plantings within the buffer area. Codes had no comment provided. Planning based zoning, planning comments not applicable. Greenways had no comment provided. All right, thank you, Mr. Bowman. So uh, if you all want to start your uh, presentation, I'll start a clock. I'll give you the two-minute sign if it's getting close and then one minute. Uh, most of the time we don't need it. If you will introduce yourself and go ahead and introduce your other guests just so we can kind of get a feel for the resource expertise that's available to us to answer questions, then uh, after your presentation we'll get started with the rest. My name is Ryan Henderson, uh, one of the applicants. This is Austin Wareheim, uh, legal counsel with Ortel Kelly and John Patterson with Kimley Horn, uh, civil engineer. Um, just to kind of introduce myself and my family, um, our family also includes my wife, Erin Brockway, who's also on the applicant. Um, she's un unfortunately unable to be here due to scheduling, overseeing care of patients in one of our local hospitals today. We have two children, ages four and a half and six years old. Um, we've grown to love this area, this neighborhood that we're uh, currently in. We love being on the creek, utilizing it, enjoying the wildlife that it offers for us to see in the mornings and the evenings. Um, we hope to stay here for many years and I actually hope to grow old in this house um, and over the years to come. We're asking to build a garage not just for mere convenience but also for personal security, especially with our odd hours of being required to go in and care for emergent patients. Um, either early in the morning or very late at night, um, also for the security of our personal property. In doing so, we aim to decrease the current overall impervious footprint up on the property. And we have spoken with our neighbors and provided with you is, uh, their show of support and their addresses um, to support our request for variance. And with that, I'll hand it over to Austin. Technology rich today, are we? <laughs> okay. I'll subtract that time from oh, your time. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't think we'll need it, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Uh, as he said, my name is Austin Wareheim. I work at Ortel Kelly Law Firm, and largely my role here today is to kind of explain the history of this uh, property, and because our, our law firm has been involved with uh, Ryan Henderson since around 2017, I believe, is when you contacted one of our partners at the firm. Uh, and he assisted in a lawsuit that took place involving this property. So as you can see um, from the timeline provided on the screen, uh, the previous owners had been in front of this committee and had obtained a variance uh, as they were planning to uh, rebuild on the property. Uh, unfortunately, they did not comply with all of the requirements of that variance. Uh, including the floor level. Uh, in June of 2013, there was a sale of the property to Mr. Henderson and uh, Ms. Brockway. The variance issues were not disclosed in that sale, so they bought it without, without knowing. And then in December of 2015, they started to explore the idea of putting in a garage and discovered these variance issues. Um, they wanted to make sure they could stay in the home, so when they came in 2017, they just sought a variance to leave the house as it was. Uh, and, and so they did not have to sell a very new, very nice property uh, that was on, on the creek. Uh, this committee granted them the variances, which included some uh, buffering being built and the like, and, and they have complied with those 
Uh, now we are back today. We are seeking a variance to add a garage behind the home. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, Committee Member Galbraith, uh, in the very first hearing, you, you made the comment that residents must mitigate if they live on a storm buffer area. Well, I'll propose to you, and I'll, I'll let the engineer speak to this and how it works, but from everything I have seen from this plan, it not only mitigates, but actually improves the storm water flow on this property and puts more water into the ground rather than into this creek, because we are increasing the amount of pervious space on this property. And uh, so I'll let the engineer speak to the science behind that. But uh, to me, it seems not only as a mitigation, but as an improvement to the property. Uh, good morning, John Richard Patterson, Kimley Horn. So uh, we prepared a PowerPoint. If it's not on your iPads, I dropped off a hard copy right in front of you. Um, the second page shows you the requested variance. Uh, it shows you a picture of the driveway with a car in front of it. Um, we are proposing to put the garage over existing asphalt. So where there's currently impervious area, this is where the garage uh, plans to be. Uh, you can see it there with the red box. Um, obviously, there's a hardship with this site um, that, that requires us to get this variance. We back the site was platted back in 1946, and at, at that time, the only restrictions on this property were pretty much the front building setback with the um, plat, and then anything that was associated with the code as regarding side buffers. So now that uh, we're a few years later, Metro Water Services has uh, put in place the buffers, which have been triggered because of the house redevelopment. So now, as you can see on the um, exhibit, the buildable area from the plat uh, was roughly 43% of the total site. The site's 0.79 acres. Now it's down to 8% of the total site. Uh, it's shown in that image in blue. So um, the buildable area of this lot is pretty much already taken up by the existing building. So any improvements to this building can only go vertical without any type of variance um, from the committee. Uh, and with a garage, obviously, you can't go vertical. So we've looked at placing it in the back where there's an existing uh, driveway over the existing driveway. Um, so that leads to the mitigation part of this. So uh, our first form of mitigation for the garage would be that if you're, if you're looking at proposed mitigation one, there's a red dash line that outlines the existing driveway. So we're proposing to put the garage over it. Um, we will incre in, uh, encroach a little bit into the existing green space by two to three feet to be able to fit a car within the garage and have space to back out. But everything north of it with, uh, that's not necessary for car functionality to turn in and back out will be converted to green space. So there's ultimately a 85 square foot increase in pervious green space proposed in this area. Um, that's, that, that, so that's one, that's an increase in pervious. Two, we've uh, proposed to replace uh, the existing driveway because grading is gonna be required to make all this work anyway and replace the existing blacktop driveway within the zone, in one, zone one and zone two buffers with permeable pavers. So those have been sized, they'll collect the water that falls onto it, so therefore sending more water into the ground and less water to the creek. Um, I don't, that's roughly 946 square feet of uh, pavers. Um, the third uh, improvement, well, Improvement. So there's three existing cisterns today back from the issues in 2017 that were put in place to help capture runoff from the driveways. So we plan on keeping those and one, routing the roof runoff from the garage to the cistern. So again, capturing that storm water, putting it into the ground um, as, as much as the volume of those cisterns and then leaving the third cistern on the right in place to capture additional runoff from the driveway that, that is not captured by the pavers. Um, anything obviously, anything over the cistern's volume overflows uh, into the stream behind the site. Uh, and then there's also some grading that's in associated with it to mitigate for a floodplain compensation to make sure we're not filling within the floodplain. So we think uh, these three forms of mitigation and the floodplain compensation ultimately does not Negative impact, negatively impact anyone downstream, but also improves runoff situations of this site. Um, 
So yeah, any questions you have, we're happy to answer. Did, did you address the second floor elevation? Is that, would that meet the current flood requirement? So livable elevation. Sorry, yes. So the sec the the garage has a second floor livable space, which will be uh, it's second floor, so it'll be well above the base floor the base uh, flood elevation of the hundred year floodplain. Okay. So at this time, uh, does that conclude your uh, your comments? All right. Thanks, sir. Right, is there anyone here like to speak in favor of the current proposal? All right. Anyone here like to speak in opposition? Okay. Do we have any emails, voicemails, city council representative letters? We, we did have a letter um, from the council member, that not really in support or opposition, just neutral, kind of um, letting the engineers and the committee make a decision. Okay. All right. Seeing that we have no uh, additional public comment, we'll close the public hearing and we'll open it up for a committee deliberation. Um, I, I just want to get clear in my head from the staff, where is the zone one and where is the zone two? Which line? That's the zone one. Okay. So they're well into the zone one with their proposal. Okay. Typically, zone one um, intrusions are not things that we mitigate to this level of intrusion. We typically try to work with folks if they're somewhat getting into the zone two, because we're also obligated to protect the zone two, but we try to be very as protectful of the zone two as we can. But a zone one intrusion, that's kind of the last line of defense for the creek. Um, a, a significant portion of your home is already in the zone two. If I'm reading the, the map properly, you've already been granted one variance by this committee to have your existing dwelling there. As you heard from the previous case, that's a pretty rare thing. And now you're asking us for more. So that's the facts yeah, as I'll I understand I'll point out them. that that image that you looked at was a shadow. So you can see the, the house is in zone one. That dark area is just a shadow of the house. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I'm just talking so about the. I thought, I thought you were saying the house the, was in zone one. No, the addition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is totally in zone yeah. one. Yeah, got it. yeah. Okay. But yeah, thanks for that clarification. I, I didn't think the I house was that said. big. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said zone one. Maybe you did. I apologize for not being clear on that. No, I think you may have been. I just probably misunderstood. And I just wanted to clarify that the 2017 request was more of a show cause hearing for the original owner to because they you didn't would explain. Meet the you explain to us what a show cause hearing is. I, I don't. I, maybe legal could. I wasn't involved in that case. Okay. You want to address the concept of a show cause hearing so you can see what 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 bearing that has on potential precedents in regard to. They're expanding a previous variance request. I'm not aware of the procedural history, what what you're referring to in this one. So what what, what impact would a show cause hearing have on today's, I guess, facts? I, I don't think there's an impact. I was just trying to make it clear okay. that okay. it wasn't, he wasn't necessarily, they, they didn't build this as a new house at that time and then request the finished floor to be below. There was the original variance in 2007 that requested the finished floor below. And, or, or something wasn't built in compliance, and so they had to do that show cause hearing. Okay. So I think what you're saying is we took enforcement action because they did. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that doesn't have any bearing on this. It's just a procedural history wise, we had to make them show cause as to why we shouldn't take action against them for failing to comply. I understand. Yeah, that, I'm sorry for generalizing that, but it. <laughs> To, to me, the dwelling is the dwelling, no matter who owns it, and so it's it's been granted one variance in the past that typically we don't grant, and that, that that's the point I was trying to make. So, all right, and uh, you know, uh, we find ourselves repeating this a lot. Um, you know, there are two kind of hardships 
that we deal with in these hearings. One is kind of similar to what I experienced coming here today. I drove five miles and I went through 15 traffic lights. That some days that's a hardship for me. Uh, it's a hardship having to deal with the regulations. The kind of hardship that we're talking about, the legal hardship that we're allowed to consider is a hydrogeomorphic anomaly on the landscape that the ordinance, the original buffer ordinance, could not have anticipated. So you'd have to have a very unique topographic feature, a very unique hydrologic feature, a very unique uh, geologic configuration uh, of natural resource um, uh, components on the site that the ordinance could not have envisioned. And so therefore, uh, you really don't have the type of hardship that we can consider. You have difficulty, but you don't have the kind of hardship we could consider. Uh, yes, I think we were just trying to point out the fact that when this was platted, nothing was in place. So obviously today, the plat would never have been able yeah. to pass like that. Yeah, I, I completely understand. And, and everybody comes in and says they've got a hardship, which in normal language makes total sense. Legal language, as the gentleman in the middle knows, is another issue. <clears throat> So did their previous show calls also allow mowing of the buffer? I assume it did. Yeah, that's correct. The buffer signage, we the existing landscape area was on the original variance. And yeah, we typically don't allow mowing of the zone one either, so see. All right. Um, I don't normally do this, but I'm, I'm inclined to uh, make a motion to share the burden that the rest of the committee members have already borne today with, with their motions and move that we deny the proposal based upon our past practice of reviewing zone one intrusions. That's my motion. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second that. Are we in this second? Is there any further discussion the motion? Okay, uh, did, did the motion get recorded? Okay, we have a motion to deny, it's been properly seconded. Is there any discussion? If I could just ask if there are any recommendations that the staff might have that where we could add some sort of protection for the cars in the back, is there, are there any considerations that um, may, may appease the, the committee that we could add here? Are you just looking for, are you asking for parking or are you asking for um, a, a, a something to deal with the dwelling? Those are two different things. Or, I mean, could we, could you clarify that for me? Uh, well, for example, um, <laughs> not supposed to do this, am I? If Ms. Costones were here today, she would be glaring at me across the room with, with helpful eyes. And I, I didn't mean to apply, she, she gives me mean looks. But, uh, but, um, uh, um, what is your setback on the, do you know what the side yard setbacks are on this property? Uh, the side yards are five foot. Five foot mm -hmm. in side yard? Mm -hmm. And do you know how far that building sits from the property uh, line? Well, they're either five, sorry, I messed up, they're 10 foot. 10 foot. We, yeah, I, I mean, we looked at putting a garage on the, the side, but- Well, I'm just curious, what, what is the side yard distance from the building to the property line, do you know? From the building, the existing building to the property line, mm -hmm. I don't, I, if I'm gonna have to guess the main here, it looks about 20, so, 20 I mean, 25 feet. I've, I've done this before, I mean, you maybe get a variance for the side yard and then just do a drive through, just a straight through with the door on the front and the door on the back. It's pretty cool. It might work. And you can do a living space above that. It's possible. But, you know, the committee's not, like Dodd said, I mean, we had to consider hardship and not really a hardship. So, yep. but that's, you wanting advice? 
Advice is free. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, you know, there's nothing we can do today in that regard. We, we've got to act on the variance in front of us. So, uh, it, I, I'm, if you don't mind, I'm just unless you're willing to comment on the existing variance proposal, uh, we can't really respond to the consult free consulting advice. No. Just give it. <laughs> it was just instead of the garage, uh, like a portico chair, or just the garage with no living space. If that would change anything. I, I, I think you'll need to consult with staff on that. Yeah. yeah. Zone one's a really tough place. To we would definitely on. be interested in. We've, we've talked about adding plannings that were recommended by staff as well. Mm -hmm. There at the end of the back of the driveway that would be the permeable pavers. Um, so that would be, we'd be happy to add that in as well um, to help with any runoff not collected by the cisterns, not taken by the permeable pavers and already treating what's on top of the proposed garage. Well, just to give you a little little bit of further insight, um, uh, we have denied uh, zone two intrusions like this as well. We're usually looking for a minor intrusion in zone two with mitigation or no intrusion. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Motion has been made and seconded. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the denial say aye. 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 All those opposed? Sorry, folks. Okay. The next applicant, if you'll come forward. One, two, three. So I think we're on Trimble Road. Is that correct? Okay. All right, 3811 Trimble Road, 2021-00010. Thank goodness we have one less zero in that case number. All right, so uh, did you all hear the opening legal statement? You understand your rights of appeal? Okay. All right, uh, so Mr. Bowman or whomever is ready to introduce the case, if you'll introduce the case, we will give you 10 minutes to make your uh, presentation. Apologize you had to wait on us so long this morning. Uh, and then after that, we'll open the public hearing, and then after that, we'll have our discussion. Thank you. All right. Case number four on the agenda is case 2021-00010-3811 Trimble Road at 3811 Trimble Road. APN is 130-08-00-9300. Inspector is Kimberly Hayes, Council District 33, Angie Henderson. Applicants request disturbance of 25-foot stream buffer to reconstruct patio, mowing and maintenance of the 25-foot stream buffer, enhancement of stream buffer, and waiver of engineer seal requirement. Appellant is Anthony and Shanna Bellot, represented by Scott Dismukes, Firma. Comments, stormwater staff had no comment provided, codes, no comment provided, planning, base zoning, planning comments not applicable, greenways had no comment provided. All right, thank you, Mr. Bowman. So if you would, uh, if you'd introduce yourself uh, as a lead speaker, introduce your resource experts or property owners or investors or others that, that could answer questions for us so we know who, we're, who, we, who we have the opportunity to question, that'd be great. Sure, thank you. My name's Anthony Ballot. Uh, it's my wife, Shanna Ballot. We are the homeowners at 3811 Trimble Road. Uh, this is Scott Dismukes from Firma Studio, our landscape architect. Um, so, we purchased the home in um, November 2014, and it's been our primary residence since. Um, we are asking to, um, for variance to reconstruct the patio behind the house. There is a creek that runs behind the house. Um, we have not had any issues with the creek overflowing, but obviously there is a 25-foot buffer. Um, so, prior to um, endeavoring to uh, work on the patio, we we were aware of the issue. We uh, engaged um, Mr. Dismukes and Firma to develop a plan um, for a design for the patio and a mitigation plan to go along with it. We have spoken to a number of our neighbors about the plan, um, and I believe uh, maybe as many as seven uh, were indicating they were going to communicate to the committee. Uh, I don't know if that actually happened. Um, and, and based on the conversations that I've had in the, with neighbors, we have not seen any objection to, uh, to our request. Um, 
And at this point, I think uh, I'll just turn it over to Mr. Dismukes to describe the, the plan. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, my name is Scott Dismukes. I'm a registered landscape architect here in Tennessee. Um, uh, I am founder and principal of Firma uh, Landscape Architecture and Planning Studio. Um, so um, the ballots asked us to look at making improvements to an existing patio uh, and a replacement of an existing hot tub and deck. So what you're seeing up on the screen, can you go to the next? Uh, no, go, sorry, go back, yeah. Yeah, that, so that's the existing condition of the rear of the house. What we're talking about today is just in the rear of the house um, and the rear property. The overall property is 0.78 acres. Um, and so you can see, I apologize if it's hard to see, but there is an existing patio. Um, there's an existing patio there. One's a dining area, one's a sort of terrace for seating, and then the hot tub deck. So all of that currently sits outside of the 25-foot setback minus about 10 square feet uh, that's within that setback. Just to note, that setback, it's not a zone one and zone two buffer. It's a 25-foot setback, as we had confirmed with uh, stormwater. Uh, because of the way it's grandfathered in. Um, so that's what we are working around. Um, so our next plan. So this is our proposal, which is to maintain uh, the existing lower dining area, um, not changing that footprint, and then to remove the uh, existing flagstone and wood deck and existing hot tub and replace it with a new elevated stone patio. It's not covered. Um, and we are adding in total about 10 square feet just for circulation and to get uh, steps down from that. Um, it's 20 square feet total that's within the buffer, but if you account for what, in essence, we're trying to we're also accounting for the 10 feet that was outside the buffer earlier. Um, and that's the extent of the hardscape work that we are uh, asking for. Um, the reason for that size is we actually started with a bigger footprint. We worked with um, city planning and realized that uh, that was probably a request that would not uh, be uh, well received, so we went back to trying to keep it as minimal as possible so that we can accommodate just a dining area, a seating area, and then that hot tub. Our mitigation efforts on this is to um, add, uh, continue to maintain roughly 40% uh, of the property across the creek as natural area. That area has never been cut. Um, one thing that we do want to do, though, is remove invasive species, such as invasive honeysuckle. Um, and at the advice of stormwater, we would like to also just add some additional trees, uh, because even though honeysuckle we don't want to keep, it, uh, we want to sort of add back some environmental services by adding trees back into that area. And then on the, uh, and then on one area that's directly opposite the uh, new terrace, We'd like to replace that with some native, just all native grasses that are a little bit uh, more aesthetically pleasing since that's the direct view out. But those would not be, it's not turf. That would be uh, like a carex, which is typical of a uh, wet soils. Um, and then on the opposite side, the Bellets, when they bought this house, uh, the, the other, between the creek and the house, that was mowed when they inherited the property. They were not aware that that area that was in that 25-foot buffer was supposed to uh, not be mowed. So we are asking for a variance to continue to mow that property, but we are, as part of this, we are willing to remove a trampoline uh, that is currently sitting within, that's that lower one, remove that just from the rear property and then reduce the amount of area on that side of the creek by 25% uh, 
with additional um, shrub trees and native grasses that would be no mow areas. Um, just a one note on the, um, this is a stream that's got a masonry wall on each side. Uh, the actual 100 year and 500 year floodplain barely extends beyond this side of the stream. So the bulk of that rear yard is not even within the 500 year floodplain. Um, I think that is really mostly what we're asking for. Is that the, the, the variance on a, the engineer's drawings is simply, um, as you know, there's a fairly significant cost associated with that because we're only increasing by really 10 square feet we're asking for a variance on, on running a full set of calculations on that. Is that a wooden bridge that I saw over the creek? There is an existing wooden bridge uh, that's across it right there, which was uh, there when they bought the house. It's, yeah. it's not theirs, it's the neighbors. Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Ma'am, would you like to say anything? Okay, no, all right. Okay, so uh, at this time, then uh, we'll open up the public hearing for those who might want to speak in favor or against the current proposal. Do we have anyone here's here to speak in favor? Anyone in opposition? All right. Any uh, emails, phone calls, voicemails, letters from council people? I did receive five uh, letters. All in favor of the variance. You from said five. Five, yeah, five okay. different ones. I assume those are neighbors. Yeah, they're all neighbors. Okay. They're all in favor of the request. Okay. All right. So it sounds like bottom line is we got a, a fairly minor intrusion in the zone one with a lot of mitigation. Okay. All right. Beautiful job. I mean, do we have a motion? I have a motion to approve the variance as. Um, requested. I think you did a very good presentation. I, I think you've overly mitigated. I think that's a great um, to be able to live so close to a stream like that and, and, and it just looks good. I appreciate I appreciate your effort. Thank you. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second to approve. Uh, I'd just like to add to Mr. Dale's case. You, you definitely went extra on the mitigation for the mitigation but you're definitely doing what the creek needs. Um, and frankly, you can never do enough for the creek to make it healthy because everything else is gone. So we appreciate that very much. It makes her, makes it cheaper to treat drinking water in this county. So when you do that. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you for your, thank you for your service to the community. Okay, um, that was a model presentation in case for those who want to know how to uh, have an efficient experience, not necessarily guaranteed experience, but efficient. Um, so that leaves us with parks at Cane Ridge phase one, is that correct? All right, so if y'all want to come on up, case 2021-00011. Did you all hear the uh, opening legal statement? Do you all, do you know your rights of appeal? Were you, were you present when that statement was read earlier? Okay, so you understand your rights of appeal, okay. All right, so Mr. Bowman, or whomever's assigned, if you'll describe it for us, and then we'll give you 10 minutes to present public hearing, committee debate, and then we'll see what we can do. The fifth case on the agenda is case 2021 Zero 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 one two Parks at Cane Ridge, Phase One, at five nine zero five Cane Ridge Road. APN is one eight two zero 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 one seven six zero zero. Inspector is Sean Herman. Council District Thirty One, John Rutherford. Applicant's request is one wetland removal and wetland buffer removal. Appellant is Dry Pack Group Forty Six LLC, represented by Jake Vincent, Reagan Smith and Associates. Comments. Stormwater staff. Staff request a multi year invasive control strategy and larger trees to ensure success of the restoration plan. Codes, no comment provided. Planning, a final site plan application has not been submitted or approved for this project. The, the Stormwater Management Committee plan has significant differences from the concept plan that planning may not support. 
Concept plan is case number 2018S-118-001. Greenways had no comment provided. Okay. Um, so at this time, if you'll introduce yourself, the folks who are with you, um, so that we have just understand who's available to answer questions. And okay. then uh, um, you've got 10 minutes. Okay. My name is Dan Mason. Um, I'm with St. Burke. St. Burke is a development and asset management group, and I'm here to represent the property owner. Um, and as you mentioned, I also have Jake Vincent with me here with Reagan Smith, our civil engineering group. And I have Silas Mathis, our wetland consultant with BDY Environmental. Um, the parts of Cane Ridge is a 238 uh, master plan community located off Cane Ridge Road in Antioch. And we do have full support from Planning Commission on the plan. And I have had some conversations with them about the changes we have made because of that was one of our requirements. So, you know, I have representation of that if we need to speak to that. Um, and we are currently in the process of our phase one construction drawings uh, for 138 lots. And now I'll let Jake speak. All right, good morning. My name is Jacob Vincent I'm with uh, Reagan Smith, uh, an engineer working on this project. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, we're working through the phase one design and those uh, construction drawings are in for a re-review with uh, Metro Water. Um, part of this phase one layout, we have two wetlands that are unavoidable right there, They're just over a quarter of an acre and we're seeking for a variance for those two wetlands. We've, there's wetlands and streams all over the property and we've preserved eight of the wetlands and, and 10 of the streams. Um, the, we talked about the concept plans already been approved and we've been reworking this layout to meet various road connections and stormwater and, and, and different design hurdles, but we've actually reduced the number of lots from the concept plan by 31 lots. <clears throat> um, back to the two wetlands, um, these are deemed to be uh, low resource, uh, a low resource value wetland based on the TDEC assessment. They are not jurisdictional from the Corps of Engineer standpoint. Um, but like I said, some of the main hurdles are the road connections of this of this site that the Metro planning has has asked us to meet. And then the biggest hurdle is the cemetery right in the middle of the site um, that we're working around to preserve. It's been noted by the community that this is a really important cemetery to save and preserve and buffer and make a kind of an amenity, so to speak, a feature of the site. So that's that's some of the hurdles that we're working around to meet all the design criteria and layout criteria. And that I'll just say that the, the variance is critical for to make this site work. But I'll let Silas talk about uh, the mitigation part of it. Hang on just a minute. Okay. I'm Silas Mathis with uh, BDY Environmental, and um, I've been visiting the site on behalf of the owner since about 2014. Um, so I've seen uh, the features on the site, the streams and wetlands on the site um, in all sorts of different seasons, different kind of rainfall conditions, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so these two features that we're proposing to alter, there it's really is unavoidable um, based on some of the constraints we've got going on. The, the two features, the lowest resource value uh, water resources on the site, um, like Jake just said, the, the Tennessee Rapid Assessment methodology that TDEC uses to score wetlands puts them firmly in the low resource value category. And um, just to give you a little background on that, the, the wetlands are um, 
they're they're seasonally saturated features I, like i said i've been out there under you know a big rain event in the spring and they never really pond so they they're about uh 12 inches of silt on top of a clay layer and that's common across the entire site and it it that silt stays stays saturated um seasonally you know in the, in the wet part of the year and leads to some wetland conditions um, these are historic relict features left over from farming. I think they quit farming probably in the 1960s on this property. And they're just really shallow depressions that have limited connectivity to, um, to downstream waters. That's why the core considers them non-jurisdictional. Um, the upper wetland is, uh, has no inlet or outlet features, no, no channels. The lower one has uh, really weakly defined wet weather conveyances that, that drain it. So. Um, we've kind of worked through several iterations of the site plan and um, over the years, really, and, and in identifying features on the site, we've managed to avoid all impacts, all of the streams on the site. The only impact we have is, is uh, subsurface uh, boring for sewer lines. Um, and we've got an ARAP application underway for the wetland impacts that we're proposing and for the subsurface sewer borings as well. So, um, the the we've managed to avoid all of the resources other than these two wetlands and these two wetlands like i said are, are very low quality have invasive species in them and, and small trees um stunted trees so what we're um what we're really kind of up against in terms of um the constraints on the site is the, the need to keep connector roads to existing development to the west of us all the way across the cane ridge road and um, some of those connector roads, you know, are stubbed out. And we had to actually negotiate with planning a couple, several years ago to avoid um, impacts to one of our streams and, and a couple of the more high resource, about three high resource value wetlands in the southern, southeastern part of the site. Um, in doing that, we still needed to have connectivity. So road connectivity. So we had to design a roads closer to where the cemetery is. And one thing about the cemetery is that we didn't know the size of it initially. We did paid for a survey for the cemetery, an archaeological survey, and it, it, it was bigger than, than we thought during all the site planning efforts we've been doing over the years. And so that's pushed um, some of the connector roadways um, below the cemetery. Um, and also in, in the path of these wetland areas. And, and we've looked at lots of different uh, scenarios to avoid the wetlands. We've thought about retaining walls, but we felt that that would cut off the hydrology to those wetlands, given that there's no, um, that the watershed drain to the wetlands is re are really small and they're really supplied by surface runoff, not by a, a groundwater connection. So we weren't able to really come up with a viable retaining wall option. And that's why we have these impacts um, proposed. And uh, with that, um, we'd like to, I guess, try to answer some of your questions about the project. Okay, all right. So uh, does that conclude your presentation? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you very much. All right, so you're well under time. Okay, so we'll open up the public hearing now. Is there anyone here who'd like to speak uh, in favor of the current proposal? All right, see, uh, in favor? I don't know whether it's in favor or against. I'm just here to talk about it. Okay, all right, so, so we don't have a whole lot of people in the room, so let's just mix it up. So if you'd like to come up to the mic and, uh, and turn on the mic and just push the button one time, give us your name and your address please and then you, you'll have uh, a couple of minutes can you help him there mr. Lindsay okay. we can only give you a couple of minutes if that's okay. all right so. I'd like to hold a position to make a comment after the meeting itself everything yes sir uh, my name is Paul Lingler I live at 5799 Cane Ridge Road and all the properties that we're talking about was it it's a when we first bought that property, my dad bought that property in, I think it was 1955. I was five years old. And I've been all over it. I know every inch of that property, and I know the land around it. I know the existing creeks, the runoffs, how they run, how they don't run. I know the cave systems up towards where the graveyards are. The graveyard's up on the hill right on top of our property up there. It used to be our property. Those graves are go back to the early 1800s. 
even with possible slave burials there. The last grave that was put in that property right there, without our permission, with anything, was in 1956. It's on the other side down there, and I know exactly where it's at. There is an easement that comes off Cane, Cane Ridge Road right in the S-curves. It goes right up between our property line and uh, the, the old Ledbetter farm right there. And it goes right up on top of the hill. At that time now, that road has grown, grown up. But where the, all that water is coming down there now, uh, there's a cave spring right behind the house in the S-curve right there. It's a little brick house. I'm sure you all know about it. And there's a cave spring right behind it. There's a little log cabin right there. That cave spring is actually fed by the springs up on the hill back there. In the past, there's, there's hangovers in there. There's a big, like, hole dug out up there, and there's like a cliff in that hole. And we used to water the cows there. Actually, it was dug out at that time, and the water would run away from the springs. But underground, people really don't know that area. That water comes down through there. They put a dye in there. We went in that cave back in there one time. We wasn't really quite cave dwellers. But they put a dye in the water to see where the water came, and it come right out the cave. And that cave spring behind that house, when the water actually runs there, it feeds Turkey Creek. And Turkey Creek is comes right beside our property down through there. And it, it feeds that off, off the, right in the s curves. there's a piece of property right in the middle on Cane Ridge Road that you were talking about. Uh, that, that property has a big hole over in the middle of it. And it, and it, was, a, it was like a pond, but how they found it, they were digging a, a fence, had a bar stuck down in the ground. Davis Ledbetter did that. And he lost, like the loss of his bar, they dug it out and a humongous spring in there. Water at that time, I guess, was six foot deep in there, and I guess it was fifteen sir, to twenty feet wide. Sir, you, um, you're just about to, you're out of time, but oh. can, can you address the wetland issue specifically? That's what we're here to uh, yeah. discuss. Well, we do have a problem with water coming down right now. The water's going to get worse. Okay. And appreciate everybody for working on it. And at the same time, with trees being in the creek, uh, we'll address that some other time. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, is there anyone else here who'd like to make a statement, either for or against? Yes, sir. So if you'll go up to the mic, do the same thing. Give us your name and your address. Yeah. And if you could restrict your comments to the variance proposal, which is in regard to the wetland on the site. That's, that's really all we can consider. My comments today. regarding the water in Turkey Creek. I live at 5910 Cane Ridge Road. And my understanding for the development is going to put an access road into Cane Ridge Road right in front of my door. And that creek already floods extremely high. In fact, I got a picture here of this past fall with water five and six feet over my driveway. My concern is, is the handling of the water that's coming off of this development will make it worse and how that's going to be addressed. And uh, I'd like some clarification on that. I talked briefly with a couple of gentlemen. That they said they're going to build some of these holding containers and so forth and add a new ditch. I'd like to be assured that whatever's happening won't make this worse. Okay. And Thank you, sir. So Is that's there, my comment. Anything else you want to add in that regard? Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Just information how this will be handled. We'll, we'll definitely address that um, in our questions, um, and that's certainly relevant to the wetland issue and their mitigation of it. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I'll come back to you after a while if you don't mind. Okay. All right. So uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Do we have any emails, phone calls, voicemails, letters from council representatives? We did. We, we got uh, numerous letters in opposition. Um, we got a, a few letters from, um, we got one from the Mill Creek Water Set Association in opposition, and we got one from um, the Cane Ridge Community Club in opposition, and the council member um, requesting a deferral in opposition at this time. Council member. Council requested. member was, was more requesting a deferral. Okay. Is a council member here today? Okay. All right. I can read his letter if that'd be helpful. Um, I, I think it's clear. It's on your, It's within the package. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Um, so at this time, um, sir, did you have one other question you wanted to ask? Yes, I, I did. I, you want to come back up here? Yes, sir. If you just uh, please I be brief. I And I meant to say it just a while ago. Yes, uh, uh, Tawana Chick at the Cane Ridge Community Center, she wasn't able to be here today. She was in a bad accident. And uh, But anyhow, they want this brought before the Cane Ridge Community Center for discussion. That was my last thing. Thanks, sir. Appreciate that. We're, we're always mindful of the community interest and the desire for the community to get up to speed. Sometimes deferrals help with that. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you in just a minute if you don't mind. So uh, and let you answer those as any comments as a rebuttal if you like. So all right. So uh, is there anyone else who wants to share a public comment? All right, seeing none, so we'll close the public hearing. So, yes, sir, if you'd like to uh, um, offer a perspective about anything that was said, if you'd limit your comments to about two minutes per response to each individual comment, including the council representative and the, and the community input. Uh, I'd just like to add that we did have a community meeting with the Cane Ridge Group uh, Community Club, and um, I know Tawana, and she was there, and uh, I... You know, one of her and her biggest concern about the property was the cemetery. And this was previous to us completing the survey and the archaeological report. And, you know, we told her, hey, look, we're going to do that and we're going to make sure that we protect the cemetery. And part of the result of these impacts that we're causing for the wetlands is because we're doing our best to protect that cemetery for the, pro you know, for, for the community and follow through with what we said we would do. Um, you know, it, the, from the report, the grave area is roughly about a quarter acre and we've set aside all close, almost two acres of land for it. So, you know, we're, we're doing our best that we can to protect the cemetery okay. and that's mainly why we're here. Yeah. I appreciate you bringing up the cemetery, but that's really not part of why we're here. So, okay. So, uh, um, was there any kind of response you wanted to make in regard to the deferral that the council, because obviously there's. It's pretty common for people to kind of update their awareness uh, after they've told the applicant something else earlier in the week or earlier in the month. So we have a, a request to defer. Do you have any, any, do you want to ask for a deferral before we discuss this further or, or do you want us to continue to debate it? Does he have, does he say why he wants the deferral? Can I ask that question? Why don't you read the letter there, Logan? So. Our uh, procedures specifically require us to integrate council representative input. All right, Here, here's his letter. It says, Mr. Bowman, I concur with the below request for deferral until October for the purpose of community engagement. I am aware of the prior community agreement and believe anything that varies from that agreement should be heard in a community meeting format. I have been contacted by several community members, including many direct neighbors to the property in question who raised concerns. They should all have an opportunity to be heard in a community meeting. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for your consideration. John Rutherford, Councilman, District 31. And I think the, the request that he's referring to is either the letter from Mill Creek Watershed Association or the Cane Ridge Community Club, Miss Miss Chick, that was referenced earlier. Okay, and you don't know if that request for the referral was related to stormwater or related to the cemetery or related to planning decisions? Well, the, the Cane Ridge Community Club had a, uh, a know, court, according to the letter, had a stormwater interest. Yeah, I don't know if it's stormwater or okay. related or not. Okay. It's All just right. a list of concerns. Okay. Do, what, do, what, do the list of concerns include a stormwater concern? I didn't get the list. They just said there was okay. a, a list. Okay. I think it did. It was clarified in the Mill Creek Watershed letter. They gave a bullet listing of the things that they would like yeah. to review with the community first. And it was related to access to and time to review the initial natural resources, regulatory constraint analysis of the site undertaken in 2014, okay. evaluation by TDEC with regards to the presence of state endangered species, uh, community engagement events to actively address the concerns of the Cane Ridge community related to the proposed development. Okay. So that, that brings me to a question for you. Um, you mentioned that um, there's, these are evidently non-jurisdictional wetlands. Um, do, do you have letters from the Corps of Engineers and TDEC stating that? 
Uh, yeah, let me clarify. They, they are non-jurisdictional to the Army Corps of Engineers, but they are TDEC jurisdictional wetlands. Okay. Okay. And um, obviously, and we have jurisdictional letters. to us. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have a hydrologic determination from okay. TDEC that confirms that, and an approved jurisdictional okay. determination from the Army okay. Corps. All right. I, I, just trying to make, because normally we, we don't really encourage moving forward until we know you've gone through other channels before you come to us as well. So, um, so at this point, um, what, what comments or questions do members of the committee have? Do we have any photos so, of the so wetlands? Has, has the concept plan expired? Is that what's called? Are you going back to planning to renew a concept? Or are you getting ready to submit a final plan? Or what? What? We're currently what? doing construction drawings. Or you're doing construction drawings? Yeah. So, so, at, so yeah. Are you, are you required to revise the concept? Because of, or do you know or go I, back to that process again? I, conversations and emails with Jason Swagger and know that you know I've you know sent him the revised plan to uh -huh. account for the cemetery and uh -huh. you know he said yes we agree so it's, it's the staff it's, level thing yeah okay and then so we've again just started with the construction drawings and had our first round of comments right and so this is integral with, with correct what wanting to do. correct so you're not you're not having you don't have to go back to the public process of planning no okay no. all right because a lot of the stuff that I'm hearing, I think that the community wants to get involved in, to me, seems like it's beyond what we would consider here, probably. Um, like locations of cemeteries and stuff like that. I don't think we would be getting involved in that. Um, but that's why I asked the question. Okay, so... Um now, here's some pictures for everybody of the wetlands in question, uh, the state jurisdictional and metro, quote, jurisdictional wetlands. Um, to address the comment earlier about low quality resource, um, um, do you think that's based upon the way these wetlands have been managed or based upon the ecological status of these wetlands as a natural process? Um, the Tennessee Rapid Assessment Methodology takes into account both of both um, human in impacts and also sort of the natural ecological condition. And as far back as I can tell, it looks like er, the site stopped being farmed around the 1960s and historic aerial imagery kind of shows these features at the bases of two small fields. And from what I can tell, <clears throat> there are old farm roads that are kind of around them and through them. I don't know if they're just really the lower one in particular may have been an old pond that filled in over time. Um, but the, the whole Cane Ridge area just has that, that yeah, the clay confining layer in a lot of locations on these the, the sort of the toe of different slopes. And that just captures water and, and creates these little seasonally saturated features. And, the, the upper wetland has a, you know, has a, a eastern red cedar growing right in the middle of it, which is, you know, a facultative upland plant, and, and there are uh, maples and the um, sugar maples in the lower wetland, which are also fac up. And so there's, the, the trees are kind of stunted, like they've just never come back, whereas on other areas of the site and similar type wetland features, you've got taller trees and and, uh, and and more resource value in my mind just based on that habitat um, and also the connectivity that they, they the, the other wetlands have and these just really don't um, so they're they're the kind of thing where if you go out in the fall you, you'd walk right over it and wouldn't wouldn't know it was a wetland okay that, that helps me understand it I mean it does sound like there's a history of degradation by human activity it, it does sound like uh, based upon the previous comments of the two residents that there's a lot of local concern about water, natural water systems being preserved and flooding not getting worse. Um, uh, our discussion today is, the frame or scope of our discussion today is on these two wetlands and unfortunately not the larger stormwater controls unless they're related to the wetlands specifically. Um, but just to comment about the wetlands specifically, typically, I mean, going all the way from proposals we've gotten in Metro Center to a proposal I think we heard last month, farm ponds, we generally don't have a, 
that qualifies wetlands at any level. We generally have found those are easier to justify mitigating natural systems, even if they're ecologically degraded uh, like this, they do have the potential to be restored. Um, I, I realize what y'all were saying earlier is that you feel like you couldn't avoid these wetlands, but we're dealing with a proposal now to develop these sites. So you, you can avoid them if we ask you to, unfortunately. You may not be able to make as much money on those parcels with those wetlands as you would have had previously. Um, I, I don't imagine that the parcels that are occupied by these natural, lower quality ecological status wetlands are going to make or break your profitability on the site. Uh, but um, um, that is the question that's in front of us today is should these be mitigated? So typically, you know, we really can't grant a variance unless there's a very unique topographical, hydrologic, geologic, natural anomaly on the site. This is, these are common occurrences no matter what, what, what the quality is. And so typically we don't grant variances for things that, that uh, are natural and that we don't have a true legal hardship to justify it, so. Um, yeah, can I speak to, um, I guess, kind of the, the, the process, I guess, with this figure up here that, that we went through in, in kind of determining that? And maybe, Dan, you could speak to the... Um, yeah, I mean, the collector road that runs through the property is, is something that planning staff has really kind of pushed on us to do. Um, so that's another reason that we're impacting these because that road is a collector road that services you know a, a larger area to the west as well and planning staff has basically told us that hey this road needs to be built this is on our trans future transportation plan it's a road they want built um and so that's another hardship for us is that hey their planning staff is asking us to build this road because it's on a future transportation plan. Yeah, that, that is a type of hardship. It's just not the one we're allowed to consider. And I guess the, the other piece that we're kind of missing in our, in our part of the discussion was that we are proposing mitigation. We've got, I think, six separate planting areas totaling uh, 1.35 acres um, to make up for the loss of the wetlands and, and the buffer surrounding them. And those plantings would be on the slopes um, leading down to the riparian zones that we're protecting on the site. And um, we'll, we'll, we propose to monitor those for three years. Um, with, uh, the plantings will be 12 trees, 12 feet on center. Um, we're working out some of the details with stormwater, but um, we're, we're going to um, mow around them to ensure survivability during that period. Um, so th that's our mitigation. The other mitigation piece is, of course, the TDEX requirements, and we're purchasing mitigation credits. And I know that's from an in-lieu fee program, but I know that's not as, uh, as big an emphasis here because in Metro you like to see the, the mitigation happen either on site or at least in Davidson County um, or the watershed. <coughs> and so we, we do have a, a mitigation plan um, that's part of this as well. And uh, we... You know, I guess one of the topographic constraints we had to deal with is is just in placing those roads. We had the the cemetery, which ended up being larger than we thought, and so through all this planning, you know, we, we moved one connector road um, to the south there, that that southern connector road that's now just a cul-de-sac that peaks onto the site. We we had to work with planning to move that so that we wouldn't end up impacting two two of the wetland feed three wetland features in the stream, and so that pushed the connectivity requirement to the north, um, to the existing roads to the north, and that's how we ended up having to go through topographically through near the center of the site below that, that cemetery feature. And so that's why it's pushing the roads towards those two low resource value wetlands. Okay. Mr. Dale, do you have a question? Uh, question legal. <clears throat> so if I recuse myself from this, do you lose a quorum? I think that's going to have to happen. I, I, um, I've worked too intimately on this pro project. I think I would be influenced yes, you, by what I've done. You uh, would. You need four 
you yeah. need at least four to have. To yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm so intimately familiar with this. I mean, this is pretty much my layout. Okay. Um, I just don't think it would be proper for me to be involved in it. So I, I have no choice but to recuse myself, which is going to force this to be deferred anyway. Okay. So um, and, and we're in a bit of a legal quandary because normally we have to vote on a deferral and we don't have a quorum to vote on a, a deferral. Well, you lose, you lose, you just lose your quorum. So I think that's what happens. Then so. we have to adjourn. So, mm -hmm. okay. And okay. Unfortunately, I can't open up the public hearing again, sir, but we'd be glad to talk to you after the meeting just to get, just to hear your concerns. We just can't do it on the I way. had to sit here and think about this a little bit, but I just don't it look like we're going to so. defer. So. Sorry. No. All right. So, uh, can I have one more question? Um, or not? If it's related to the deferral, yeah. Only about the deferral. Okay. No, yeah. I don't. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so we don't have a quorum. We're going to have to adjourn, uh, and you gentlemen are going to have to return another time. It sounds like you have a council representative that's asked for that anyway. So, uh, so um, um, I, in the absence of additional clarification from council uh, I'm going to assume that you've got a 30-day referral deferral on this so we'll look for you to come back next month I'd strongly encourage you to have as many of, of these community interactions as as is being requested before you come back um, you know the this is just me trying not to be an independent consultant here but um, you seem to be subject to a lot of other people's direction that has created situations that you feel like you can't avoid. All of this is a proposal. If if you don't go forward with it, you don't have all those problems. So it, it, when you come back, we really need to hear a justification for why these natural systems need to be converted to something man-made. That's what mitigation is. And uh, the reason we're trying to preserve these natural features is to reduce those flashy flood peaks that Mr. Dale was referring to earlier. You know, if we keep eliminating every wetland in the county, every depression in the county that's natural, that soaks up water for us, we're going to get taller and taller floods on top of the ones we already get. And going to the gentleman's question earlier about concerns about runoff. So we need to preserve natural features as much as we can. And it's already a big compromise when we develop the watershed legally. So. All right, so with that, uh, Mr. Hughes, so gentlemen, thank you for your participation today. I'm sorry we couldn't, couldn't uh, address it. Mr. Hughes, I mean, Mr. Hunt. Yes, um, just for the sake of efficiency, I would note uh, as you prepare to come back to consider the staff comments on this case, it might facilitate a quicker resolution. Okay, all right. Um, Mr. Dale, I think you can unrecuse yourself yeah, to vote on that, on that particular case. case. Okay. Now we're not considering that back. I'm back on, on the dock. Okay, good deal, good deal. So we can, we can adjourn when we get ready. So do we have any other business from Stormwater staff? Oh, yes, we have uh, Mr. Lindsay, yes. And Mr. Lindsay is going to give us a brief overview of um, uh, the uh, flooding that we uh, witnessed recently in uh, Humphreys County and uh, for the members who are listening in on TV or watching the recording later I think this will be pretty informative about things that may be coming to Davidson County in the future so okay all right <clears throat> Dodd had asked uh, that I provide a little bit of an, uh, an overview of some of the, the flooding events that we've experienced here recently. So um, this is kind of excerpted from a, uh, a much longer but no less fascinating presentation that I did recently. Um, so we talk about extreme events in Tennessee, 100-year um, storm events, you know, Atlas, all defined by NOAA, Atlas 14. Um, average recurrence interval, it's, it's like the, uh, an inch and a half in 15 minutes or three inches in 60 minutes. Consider that the storms that fell on Centerville and McEwen that ultimately affected Waverly, you know, there were three consecutive hours of three-inch events 
uh, for over nine and a quarter inches of rain that fell in three hours, leading up to the 17 inches of rain that fell. Um, these scale, these levels are nowhere near the kinds of levels that were experienced in Humphreys and Houston County. Almost five inches in six hours, almost six inches in 12 hours, seven inches in 24 hours. Those are all 100-year rain events. Um, and, then, and then so the, the admonition that you not confuse or conflict a 100-year rain event with a 100-year flood event, uh, rain is a function of intensity and duration. How long does it rain? How long? Uh, well, a 100-year flood comes from the Corps of Engineers and ultimately to, to FEMA and the, the flood insurance rate maps. Those are the products of HECRAS modeling of a stream uh, based on the flood profiles. Uh, in 2010, um, the amount of rain that fell over the Nashville area, you can see, you know, over much of the Nashville area, you can, you can see some 13 up through 16 inch uh, rain measured, measured rain events. Um, I like to always point out on this slide that you see that a lot of this extensive rain fell downstream of the old Hickory Dam and the Percy Priest Dam. Uh, for those that like to blame the Corps of Engineers for the, the May 2010 flood, um, that just doesn't add up. Uh, and then in the Harpeth River Basin, um, the Franklin, Tennessee area, almost 19 inches of rain that fell during those two days. Um, we talk about um, significant floods that have fallen in other areas around the south. This was a, one of a, a good number of, of news uh, headlines, but it that, that most of which I've taken out, but, but it refers to this concept of an atmospheric river. And so I want to touch a little more on atmospheric rivers. This is that same event in North Louisiana in, 20, in, this, in March of 2016, where it was referred to as a Maya Express. And a Maya Express, I'll touch on in a minute, because it's kind of a comparison of a Maya Express, a, a storm that's generated through the Central American area versus what's always been referred to as a pineapple express that dumps rain on California and, the, and other parts of the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, um, when we talk about extreme events, I became aware sometime after our flood that we had been seeing about once a year, we'd been seeing a monster event around the country, starting with like in June of 2008, Cedar Rapids, Iowa had a monster flood 11 feet higher than their previous record. Uh, in September of 2009, Atlanta, Georgia, had a 20-inch rain event in 35 hours. Um, May of 2010 was our flood, uh, 13 to 20 inches over various parts of, of middle to western Tennessee. Uh, and in May of 2011, horrendous flooding along the Mississippi River that resulted in the first activation of the, of the Birds Point New Madrid floodway in 75 years, when the Corps of Engineers built that, that floodway diversion dam along the Mississippi River, uh, it was activated within two or three years of its construction. What they do is blow the, the portion of the levee that allows the Mississippi River to flow back into the, the low-lying floodplains along the river, and it results in an immediate drop of seven feet in the Mississippi River crest in the um, uh, southern Missouri area. Um, but in 2011, after 75 years, they had to blow that levee again uh, to release waters back into those, um, those floodplain areas along the Mississippi River. Uh, 2013 was the Colorado Front Range events, 13 inches of rain. Uh, April of 2014, Pensacola, Florida had an event that 22 inches of rain in 24 hours, including five inches in one hour, 6,000 lightning strikes in 15 minutes. Uh, a big event. And then there was 2016, and we start back in March. Uh, that was that severe flooding in Louisiana and Texas that we, we saw an image of a few minutes ago, 14 inches of rain in 24 hours. Um, April of 2016 in Houston, Texas, 12 inches in 24 hours. Um, there were three different events in Texas, uh, including the one in Brenham, Texas, that resulted in the drowning of a number of soldiers. Um, uh, at Fort Hood. June of 2016, Oklahoma had a nine-inch event in one morning. June of 2016, again, White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, 10 inches of rain in 12 to 18 hours with 23 fatalities. 
Uh, again, June, Las Vegas had flash flooding right on the Vegas Strip. Ellicott City, Maryland uh, devastated their downtown area with a significant event. Uh, August, again, the southern part of Louisiana had a 25-inch event in three days. 75% of their homes were lost to floods, 60,000 homes impacted compared to our 10,000 homes in our 2010 flood. And then in October, you know, the hurricane started, Hurricane Matthew. Um, and, uh, and then 2017, it followed on. Northern California, the, the Oroville Dam, they, they evacuated 188,000 people that lived below the Oroville Dam. Uh, and that dam ultimately did not fail. Uh, but there was one and a half billion dollars in damages and five deaths associated with that. Um, March of seven of 20, May of 2017, Missouri and Arkansas flooding, um, and then the hurricanes again, Harvey, Irma, Maria. Um, so significant events, but I met Dr. Talbot, Dr. Kerry Talbot, who's the head of the, uh, uh, the flood research group at, at Erdick. Um, us old timers refer to that as the Waterways Experiment Station in Vicksburg, Mississippi. But he and I had met at a, a flood, uh, flood response workshop uh, that the Corps sponsored several years ago. And he, he saw my name tag and pointed out, he says, Roger Lindsay, Nashville, Tennessee. And he just, right off the top of his head, he said, May 1st and 2nd, 2010. He said, that was an atmospheric river. So he and I started some discussion. And uh, he kind of schooled me on what an atmospheric river was. And when you look and see... This is an example of an atmospheric river affecting the West Coast, a narrow conveyor belt of water vapor extending from thousands of miles out at sea, carrying on average the flow equivalent of 10 Mississippi rivers. And California is used to atmospheric rivers because about half of their rain every year comes from atmospheric rivers. But this was an example of an event that caused a 16-inch rain event in one day in Central California. Uh, part of some of his presentations that he shared with me, this was another slide just from his presentation, again, that shows another uh, West Coast atmospheric river on the left. Um, in the middle of this slide was a, a slide that reflected the, the, the Tennessee floods in May of 2010. And you can see how this event, how this flood is coming across Central America, across the Yucatan Peninsula, and again, it's carrying water vapor. Um, you see these lower slides where we talk about integrated water vapor transport. Um, that's a real key in indicator of an atmospheric river. That's water vapor uh, that's being transported at altitude. And in the case of Tennessee, as you'll see in a moment, um, the, there was a stationary front that caused that, that event to, to essentially to dump. That, that atmospheric water vapor in, in the form of 20, a 20-inch 20 rain event. And then there was Snowmageddon. That was that, uh, those of you may remember the, 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 the coastal United States back in February of 2010 had, had a monster snow event that, uh, they, that they referred to as Snowmageddon. But that was also caused by an atmospheric river. Um, and then another of the slides that Dr. Talbot provided for me actually had a depiction of the Nashville floods, the physical processes associated with heavy flooding rainfall in Nashville, Tennessee, and vicinity during 1 and 2 May of 2010, the role of an atmospheric river in those blasted mesoscale convective systems, up to 493 millimeters of rain in two days. But there again, you can see that this was this, this is where that stationary front was, that water vapor being conveyed at altitude hits the stationary front, and this, there's that mesoscale convective system, and that's what created that enormous flood that we experienced in 2010. Um, these are some of the, the QPFs. We rely a lot on QPFs at the uh, Emergency Operations Center, uh, but you can see this is an example of a, of a case where there was a Pineapple Express going on in Oregon and Washington at the exact same time there was a Mayan Express going on that dumped all that water on northern Louisiana in March of 2016. So there was a double whammy going on at the same time, and you can see from the QPF that's underneath this, you can see the intensity of these rain events, the, the reds and oranges and, and lighter colors. There was, there was some monster storm events going on at that time. 
Um, but that's the significance of these atmospheric rivers. This, this is kind of a, a slide of the southeast United States that shows the likelihood of these events occurring. Where the, the large pink and the large light blue areas indicate events either in the spring of the year or the fall of the year uh, over a period of years. And this, these two events right here, the, the two uh, the fuchsia colored uh, events over middle to western Tennessee were probably the 2010 events being shown. Um, a lot of other, the, the purples are, are, I think, are storm events. They just don't happen much during the, the summer months. But famous last words, well, at least we'll never see another flood like this in my lifetime. That's reference to the, to the term 100-year storm event. Um, so what do you call these? Just three years after our flood, we had in August of 2013, there was a big event that was moving directly east across the, uh, across the state of Tennessee and across the northern half of the city of Nashville. And this was the event that caused that extreme flooding on Briley Parkway. You can see the water flowing across the Jersey barrier that, that's in the middle of that lane of traffic. Um, horrendous event, a lot of water rescues. Uh, you can see in Dry Creek at Edenwold, the gauge went all the way to, the, to a flood stage just three years after our big event. We don't talk a lot about these other events, but in... Um, in October of 2015, uh, this is radar rainfall estimates. This is a, a graph from the National Weather Service that showed that there was a six to eight of inch of eight inch event in Murray County, just below the, the GM plant, just below the old Saturn plant in, in Murray County. Big event, um, flash flooding, uh, not over a wide amount of area, but a significant event nonetheless. Remnants of Harvey, those of you who remember August 30th and September 2nd, gee whiz, it's, a, it's an anniversary today. In 2017, we had rain totals of upwards of 8 to 10 inches of rain throughout this entire area. In the northern edge of Nashville, we had 10-inch rain events in the Whites Creek Basin. Mr. That Lindsay, a lot of flooding. can you so, pause for just a second? Sure. I'm going to entertain a motion that we adjourn at the end of your presentation so that those who need to leave can leave. So um, I move that we adjourn at the end of Mr. Lindsay's presentation. Do we have a second? Sorry. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay. Anybody who needs to leave can leave. So. Okay. So, so you see that the kind of event that we had uh, as associated with Harvey um, in February of 2019, this was the wettest February on record in, in Middle Tennessee, and you can see from the, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the colors in the, in the chart that we're at the peak of this chart with, with these levels. We, upwards of 20 inches of rain in the month of February 2019 that resulted in, in record discharges uh, from the Wolf Creek Dam. So it, I mean, Nashville's right in the middle. Uh, Wolf Creek Dam is over in this area, and uh, there's some fascinating YouTube videos that you can watch on the discharges from Wolf Creek. Uh, Fortunately, it was post post repair. You know, we, Wolf Creek Dam went through a lot of of injection of grout into the porous rock and things like that, and and uh, and it, it withstood uh, the effects of significant rain uh, during that time. Uh, in February of 2019, uh, same same kind of time frame. Uh, this is kind of a depiction of the course. Um, you know, Wolf Creek is the biggest, by far, the biggest of the Corps of Engineers storage projects. Um, and uh, the others you see, these are off the, the Cumberland uh, Center Hill Dam and, and um, the Dale Hollow, Dale Hollow Dam, um, Percy Priest Dam. You can see that you know, the, those that, that have a navigation function are up the middle, up the river. Uh, the rest have a lot of, of, of effect on the ability of these structures to store water. But not a lot in the old, in the old Hickory. Dam. The old Hickory Dam was not built as a flood control structure. It was built as a navigation, a run-of-the-river structure, as the Corps likes to call it. Um, and then in September of 2020, less than a year ago, we had an event over Mill Creek. Uh, you can see the, the, the darkest of the dark red under the Nashville area. That's the heart of Mill Creek. Uh, again, we're talking about a rain event that was upwards of 8 to 10 inches in Mill Creek. And this is another radar um, rainfall estimate. And if we could home in on that, we'd see that, again, we've got 8 to 10 inches of rain over Mill Creek. You can see the heart, uh, the, the highway system around Nashville just up above here. But Mill Creek, 
Uh, Mill Creek came out of Williamson County. A lot of this flooding came out of Williamson County. I drove down through there the next morning and saw cars washed off the road in Antioch on Antioch Pike, uh, just beyond where Antioch, uh, where where Mill Creek crosses under the interstate, and and um, there were four cars in the ditch that had been washed off the road. So and and houses with water in them. So significant events, and then. Um, because of my relationship with Dr. Talbot at Erdick, just one or two days after the March, the 27th, 28th March 2021 event, I got this, this uh, uh, atmospheric river analysis. Uh, this came from the Scripps uh, Oceanography Center, uh, the Center for Western Water and Water Extremes. Uh, Dr. Talbot has this relationship with this group that's based out of California. And before we really even started our week good, I got this full assessment of our event without asking for it from these guys in California that said, hey, here's what you just experienced. And it talks about the fact that that in the Nashville area, this is from the National Center for Environmental Prediction, um, that you can see that, that our event... Um, the, the, there's a, a number of different hard to read little components of that there, but you know the Nashville Airport reported significant rain events, almost six inches on March 27th, fourth highest daily precipitation on record, uh, March 2021. Middle Tennessee was anomalously, anomalously, anomalously wet across Tennessee, with some parts receiving more than 200 percent of their normal precipitation. Um, this slide shows that you know what happened in in the uh, uh, the uh, Duck River Basin during that event. Significant. It went all the way to major flood levels. Um, the uh, downtown area. We were just into the minor flood level in downtown Nashville uh, during that March 27th event. So we did go to flood stage. That's about a 40 foot stage elevation on the river at the Woodland Street Bridge about 12 feet short of where we went in 2010, but into flood, uh, flood zone nonetheless. Um, and then you can see some of these. The, the IVT, the vapor transport, is portrayed on the left graft, uh, and the water vapor, um, the concentration of water vapor is, can, is portrayed in the right. And this was an example that shows that you got a lot of water vapor coming out of the, the Central America area, and it's flowing up across, and it's dumping a lot of water right in that zone uh, along the Middle Tennessee area, and that's that's uh, that's what how they were able to conclude that we indeed had had another atmospheric river in March of this year. Um, then this is a comparison back to the May uh, 2010 event and the kinds of of. Uh, uh, vapor transport that was going on in May of 2010. You can see how extreme. These are two different images separated by 12 hours. And you can see that here at, at uh, 1200 um, universal time uh, that we're into the white zone. Uh, we're transporting over, uh, you know, 1200 to 1400 kilograms per meters per second of vapor transport that's being dumped on Tennessee that created our big event. So you can see the kinds of magnitude um, of this event. The, the slide concludes that the March 2021 event featured a more robust aggregation of water vapor um, in a developing atmospheric river over the southeast United States. So there were a lot of similarities in that. And then last week, August 21st, estimated rainfall to totals, you can see, you know, the magnitude of this event over Humphreys County and Houston County uh, and, and uh, you know, 17 inches in, a, in one day uh, was, a, was an amazing event. Well, I reached out this time to the guys on the West Coast and I said, hey, we just had another monster event. Did it look like another atmospheric river? And so after just a day or two, um, they responded um, by a, a number of different um, uh, statements relative to their review of the August 21st event, uh, an extreme precipitation accumulation over Middle Tennessee, again, combined a quasi-stationary pattern combined with anomalous atmospheric moisture, 
um, to create an environment favorable for high intensity and long duration precipitations. Um, the fourth bullet says this event is not characterized as an atmospheric river. It is one example of the many meteorological features that can lead to flood um, producing precipitation in Tennessee. But you can see there in the middle the Piney River gauge, you know, how fast that gauge went from just base flow all the way up to major uh, flood levels in, um, uh, in the area just east of the Tennessee River. So a staggering event, no doubt. And I'll back up, back up. This was an image from the New York Times. Um, when I started looking at the National Weather Service's recap of the, of the significant events, significant rain measurement in different cities, like McEwen had 17 inches, Centerville had 17 inches, Dixon had 13 inches, uh, and I was like, Waverly's not on this list. And, and the reason is obvious from this picture. This, the heart of the 17-inch event that you can see kind of on that ridge line feeds a number of major stream systems. Waverly's right over here on the edge up at the top. But you see that the 17 inches of rain over about a 20 square mile drainage basin on Trace Creek um, all funnels down through the heart of Waverly. And it seems like when you look at the weather serve at the national the, the flood insurance rate maps for Waverly, um, that the bulk of the development, the bulk of the homes and, and the businesses in Waverly are right along Trace Creek. There's a there's a there's a, a flat valley right in the middle of Waverly, and there there had to have been like a wall of water coming down uh, through that because. Uh, we heard from Chief Survey at, at the fire department, who, who's uh, head of our emergency operations center. Uh, they had heard that there was a count of over 600 structures throughout these areas, not just Waverly, that were totally destroyed. Um, swept off, buildings swept off their foundation. The pictures we've seen, the aerial views are just, are just amazing. Um, so, and then you look again, a little more detail from the the, the guys at the at the Extreme Weather Center in California. There was there was in this case another stationary front um, that with combined surface flow, uh, extremely moist air parcels over um, to, to rise over central Tennessee, initiating thunderstorms and heavy precipitation. So you see that image. Um, the, um, it, it talks about, you know, once the convection was initiated, the upper level flow propagated the storms, uh, resulting in the training of storms over the same location for hours. Um, long duration, high intensity precipitation combined with the um, precipitation pro produced by remnant tropical, tropical cyclone Fred resulted in seven day accumulations of over 15 inches all across north central Tennessee. Um, more of their images, the vapor transport and the moisture content. There, you, you can see kind of indicators of, of the um, the frontal boundary that that contributed to that. The anomalous moisture in that west, uh, the left side there, um, the the precipitable water anomalies that were two to two and a half times uh, standard deviations above normal. So combined effects, these anomalous moistures with a stationary frontal uh, boundary. Uh, and then also from the Global Forecast Center, um, again, there's, there's an indicator of extreme moisture resulting in extreme flooding in that western, in that left um, image, uh, and then the um, extreme flooding that's indicated in the vapor transport image on the right. So, you know, this particular event was not, again, a, an atmospheric river, but, but just a, a, a freak meteorological scenario. Um, so, and that's what I asked him about. Is this, a, is this a, an atmospheric river? The answer is no, but, but obviously uh, you can get a really freak event uh, without having an atmospheric river. Um, I think that's more of the same. One week later, this was the QPF we looked at. We looked at this with Hurricane Ida. Uh, this was the indicator of the kind of, 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 of rain that we expected coming through um, the southeast, through the middle Tennessee, um, so this was early. This was like Friday, uh, and it's one of the angriest, most most vivid QPFs that I've seen in all the years I've been watching QPFs as part of our flood forecasting tool. Um, it continues to be 
an ugly thing to look at, um, even as we go up. So in reality, then, in reality, it looks like we got less water than the northeast. It, yeah, I, I think overall the track of the storm shifted far enough to east, so we got some of that 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 curl back effect, but we didn't, we got nowhere near what we thought we were going to get. And then last night this occurred. I moved my daughter, my youngest daughter, to Manhattan three weeks ago. Fortunately, she's back here in Middle Tennessee on tour, uh, riding the tour bus. Um, but they are they are hurting in New York City. Um, it is um, that, that the event uh, that occurred over last. They got 12 inches of rain in in Manhattan last night. All the subways are flooded. Um, it's uh, it's astounding. Um, so you know, I talk a little bit about what we're doing. We're still we're still recovering from from the the March 27th and 28th flood event. Uh, we still have people coming in. Uh, we're we're having conversations about elevating structures, um, you know, permitting for repair and reconstruction. Um, you know, we we continue, and I can hardly read this anymore. The lights are too bright up there. Ramping up our home buyout program. We're adding to our list every day. Uh, we've got 22 new homes added to our Corps of Engineers buyout list. We'll proceed with closing on those in the in the few months to come. Um, uh, I, I told Dodd during our break a little earlier. We've got we had a, an investor in Brentwood come in. Uh, he had just bought a, a pair of houses uh, that back up to Mill Creek uh, that had significant flood damage, and his assumption was he was going to buy these things. He bought them from a company in Texas that flipped them in less than 12 hours, um, and he wants to put some fresh insulation and drywall and new cabinets and sell them for a hundred thousand dollar profit a piece. And we've broken the news to him that he's got to elevate both of them five to six feet to bring them into compliance with our stormwater ordinance. Um, tough stories for, for people that don't do due, due diligence or, or that simply don't understand um, uh, what the, the implications of our regulations are. We're continuing to operate our maps. We've got, um, we've got another new 18 map uh, series of panels that, uh, that we're going into to our final reviews on. Um, so you'll see more, we'll, and we'll talk, we'll address this group again about some of our new, new mapping efforts. We continue to add creeks and streams that had never been mapped and modeled before. We have, have achieved the, the, what's really an incredible distinction of, of having our entire county mapped and modeled, or modeled and mapped, um, and we have no unstudied A zones left in our, in our, in our entire county. So that's a, We've got counties in Tennessee that have nothing but unstudied A zones. We have none left in our mapping system. It's a it's a great thing to. So anyway, that's a lot of information in a little bit of time. Roger, I, I've got Thank a quick you. question, if I could, for those of us that are always watching the weather and preparing to act when we see these things coming. Are we getting more sophisticated? In other words, does the National Weather Service consider this atmospheric weather phenomenon? Is they're making forecast yet? You know, they're, I think they're beginning to. And, and in fact, the guys from California have offered to do some training for us, and that's something for us to set up. Uh, because they, they're using tools, I think, that aren't, aren't particularly widespread uh, in, in some of the forecasting use uh, in this part of the country. And, uh, uh, so I think uh, I think that's something we've got to, to and because it, I think it, one this is their forte they're they're experts in atmospheric rivers and and uh, while you know one out of ten storms may be caused by an atmospheric river but but if you can identify that early on um, it goes toward you know the the whole you know what's the magnitude that we might expect over a significant event watching the QPFs is is a is a good thing for us to do because. Um, because they do show fairly early, you know, the, the, the likelihood of significant events. And we've actually gone back and looked at the QPFs from like April the 30th, uh, May the 1st of 2010, and they didn't show anywhere near the magnitude of rain that we ultimately got. They, they showed about half that level. We knew it was going to be a big storm. We just didn't know it was going to be a, a monster storm. Uh, and I think part of that has to do with, you know, we, we've we watched for so many years before I really found out about, you know, the, the implications of an atmospheric river. We'd, we'd go to the Emergency Operations Center. 
when there was a big storm event coming, and we'd watch those those frontal storms, you know, move from Texas through Louisiana to Arkansas, and you know, and they just kind of, and they would they would gain in intensity and size, and and we'd watch that. But the the, the concept of an atmospheric river that's conveying that water vapor at at higher altitudes and then dumping it when it gets to a, a point where maybe a stationary front kind of blocks its continued progression. Um, that's uh, that's that was really totally that was totally game changing uh, for me. And then when I look at that that slide of the southeast United States, that's interesting to look at because there are atmospheric rivers that are happening up the east coast. Well, I don't know where they're originating. Whether they're coming out of the you know the, the Central America area as well, or whether there's some kind of a phenomenon coming from the Atlantic Ocean. I, I don't know, because because everything I've read about atmospheric rivers, especially like in California, these things typically move from kind of southwest to northeast. They, they're, they're coming, even the ones that are hitting California and Oregon and Seattle, they're coming from, you know, Hawaii, and they're, they're moving in that same kind of direction that we're seeing coming out of the Central America and the Yucatan Peninsula. And, so I don't know what feeds those those East Coast um, atmospheric rivers. I just want—I really appreciate it, Roger. I mean, your knowledge is really valuable to the city. I never heard of an atmospheric river before. It's like it's a game changer, just like you said. It changes my whole thought of everything, and it actually helps me to feel like we've done a really good thing, and that we've added the four-foot height elevation above the hundred-year flood. I mean. Been in place since 1979, yeah. Yeah. and in fact, it was called out in the New York Times article a week ago. They mentioned Nashville, Tennessee, our four-foot freeboard, yep. and described it as one of the most well, one of the most stringent floodplain. Someone was really visionary when that was done. I don't so, know who that person yeah, was, <laughs> but nobody from 1979 is still around. I'm so. still here. <laughs> I was here, but I don't remember. I know when it started. I just don't remember. Where, it you was, know, apparently was, it, was far, it was part of our original floodplain. Yeah, it's, just, and, it's incredible. And people all over the country marvel at that. Yeah. You know, I'm involved extensively with the National Floodplain Organization. Yeah. I'm in their offices three or four times a year, and, and they, they cite us all the time. They talk well, about, well, Nashville has a four-foot freeboard. You know? And now we know why. So, <laughs> didn't maybe understand why, but now it goes I think— toward, When you see the magnitude of these excessive yeah, events, these extreme crazy. events, it, it drives home how important it is to maintain a good conservative floodplain standard and... and uh, but it seems like someone in the future is going to start looking at that in conjunction with just the low pressures and the high pressures and yeah. to be able to warn people, you know, that yeah. there could be a major event. Thank you very much. Okay. See any other questions? If not, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. That was amazing. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.